Good morning, I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. The Senate Judiciary Committee is set to begin meeting soon to consider the historic Supreme Court nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson. Judge Jackson will not attend the meeting, but committee members are expected to speak and then vote on whether to advance her nomination to the full Senate. Now, no Republicans on the committee have yet voiced support for Jackson, so this vote could end in a tie, but Democrats still have the numbers to move forward with a final confirmation vote by the end of the week. And I want to bring in political reporter Brittany Shepard, along with ABC News contributors Shauna Lloyd, a trial attorney and managing partner at the Cochran Firm, Leah Wright Rigger, a history professor at John Hopkins University, former Republican Congresswoman Barbara Comstock, and Democracy for America CEO Yvette Simpson for more on this. Uh, Brittany, I'd like to start with you. Republican Senators Mitt Romney and Lisa Murkowski have yet to say whether they will vote to confirm Judge Jackson or not. What do you think they're considering at this point? Well, Diane, we heard Mitt Romney say over the weekend that he's considering Ketanji Brown Jackson judicial prudence. She, uh, they, the pair met last week, and it's likely, and the White House is crossing their fingers and hoping that bipartisan support from the public, including uh, members of the Church of Latter-day Saints, um, Mormon Church, which Mitt Romney is involved with, is a member of, supporting Ketanji Brown Jackson's nomination uh, publicly will put some pressure on Republicans, especially Mitt Romney and Lisa Murkowski, to, to move over um, to join a bipartisan ranking. Of course, uh, Mitt Romney said that he's not really concerned with other Republican attacks have been at Ketanji Brown Jackson. We saw just last week some of those attacks got pretty gnarly and very personal, attacking her record on sentencing, especially regarding child porn. And I, I think that we're going to see both today and as the week goes on, these two key Republicans keeping their cards pretty close to the chest and looking to see how she is under pressure and how Democrats are going to sell, how she believes the Constitution is a living document um, and how she will uh, rule, maybe not politically, but, you know, with consensus of the rest of the Supreme Court. And now, Shauna, Republicans during the confirmation hearings focused on Judge Jackson's sentencing of child porn offenders and her defense of Guantanamo Bay detainees. Uh, what was in her record there that raised concerns, and what can you tell us about some of these key cases that were raised? Some of the concerns they had was that they felt that she was, her sentencing was very different than what was asked for by the state or the guidelines. But historically, what we see is that judges typically are sentencing lower um, on average. So that was her, their issue with the child porn cases. Now, particularly her, her defense of the individuals in Guantanamo Bay, this was something, a case that uh, individuals she had represented before and when she went into private practice asked for re-representation. This is not unusual. Typically, once you've represented a client, they will often seek you out for other cases. And Leah, Supreme Court confirmations used to be largely bipartisan. So how has that changed over the years? And is there a way back? So certainly the contentious nature and the hostile nature of uh, Supreme Court hearings is not a new feature. It's been this way for the past couple of Supreme Court justices. But if we look, you know, a couple decades back, we see that there's broad and pretty unanimous consensus across the board for um, older Supreme Court justices. It's a reflection of how polarized and how partisan our country is right now. But I would actually look at Judge Jackson's uh, support in the broad in broader America and point out that she two thirds of Americans support this Supreme Court nomination. 88% of Americans believe that she is qualified to be on the bench. In fact, they believe that she's overqualified to be on the bench. So to me, that's an indication that the American public actually understands what is going on and the path forward. And she's going to be confirmed unless something out of, you know, uh, out, of, uh, out of a comic book happens. She's going to be confirmed. What I think we should be paying attention to is the fact that she's going onto a court with the support um, of most Americans and, in fact, is the most popular uh, nominee that we've seen in the past decade. So this is something that indicates that the American public really does stand behind her. Congress is another thing, and Congress is a reflection of partisan politics, of calculations going on behind the scenes, and again, is a reflection of the agendas that these various politicians have uh, in, in the moment.
And, and Barbara, Senator Lindsey Graham was one of a few Republican senators who brought up the fact that Judge Jackson was not the most moderate judge on President Biden's shortlist, and he calls her a favorite of the radical left. How much of the reservations on the right are related to Judge Jackson's answers during the confirmation process, and how much of it is based more on stuff behind the scenes, like the support she got and like things in her record? Well, I think Supreme Court nominations in general have become very partisan, and actually no one was more sort of involved in that than Joe Biden himself, because you have many people on this committee who have wanted to run for president over the years, and we saw that during uh, Judge Jackson's confirmation hearing. So while she will not be getting much Republican support, she already has Susan Collins, she has more than Amy Coney Barrett had, because Amy Coney Barrett had no Democrats on the committee or on the floor. And I would point out that Joe Biden voted against Chief Justice Roberts and, and Alito and many other Republican nominees, as did you know people like Amy Klobuchar and other Democrats on this committee voted against all of the Trump nominees. So unfortunately, uh, this is the way things have been. But Judge Jackson will get confirmed. So Yvette, what are you looking out for as these hearings go on? You know, I'm hoping we'll have a pretty simple process of getting at least the uh, nomination advance. We expect that to be split. And then when the actual vote happens, what I hope doesn't happen is a repeat of the hearings because Republicans got every shot and they broke, tried to break her down and they could not break her. And I think the more that they did that, the more Americans rallied around her, especially black Americans and women uh, across our country. And so I don't know that this serves them. I hope that they have set their peace. I hope they give their vote. I hope we get a couple more votes. Lisa Murkowski is up this year, so I know she's making that calculation. And Mitch McConnell, as you know, uh, is the leader, so we don't know what's going to happen. But I hope it's an uneventful day and that she gets confirmed and we can move forward. All right. Senator Durbin is giving his opening remarks now. Let's listen into those proceedings. Senate, but not one senator on this committee has questioned that she is well qualified. She has nearly a decade of experience on the bench at both the trial and appellate levels clerked at every level of the federal judiciary, including for Supreme Court Justice Breyer. She has worked in private practice, and she served as a member of the Bipartisan Sentencing Commission. Judge Jackson would be only the second trial court judge currently serving on the Supreme Court and the first public defender ever to serve on the court. These critical experiences bring a missing perspective to the court. It is truly unfortunate that some are trying to use them as reasons to vote against her. These baseless attacks are belied by the broad support for Judge Jackson's nomination from across the political spectrum. Law enforcement, former federal prosecutors, Republican appointed judges, and even more have vouched for her intellect, her intelligence, her ability to build consensus, and her even-handedness. On the fourth day of hearing, the American Bar Association came before us. They went through a laborious search of her record. I want to commend the law schools, including the University of Illinois, that poured through every written word that the judge has issued in her time on the bench. I also want to commend Judge Ann Williams, a former Northern District Court judge in the state of Illinois, and then a Seventh Circuit judge as well, who headed up the ABA committee. I asked her and those who were with her from the American Bar Association a basic question. Who did you talk to? And they said they reached out to over 250 individuals, judges, prosecutors, defense lawyers, co-counsels in adversarial situations, and asked them all to tell off the record confidentially what they thought of this judge. I asked about the allegation that's been made repeatedly by a few in this committee that she's soft on crime. They said there was no evidence, none when they spoke to the group of 250 individuals. The net result of it, the American Bar Association rated Judge Katanji Brown Jackson unanimously well qualified to serve on the Supreme Court. We've seen the evidence of her even-handedness ourselves. In her time on the bench, she has ruled for and against law enforcement, for and against immigration enforcement, for Republican administrations and also for Democratic administrations, for and against labor groups. At her hearing, she detailed the methodology she applies to ensure that she comes to each case with an independent mind. Frankly, I found her explanation far more insightful than if she had invoked contemporary labels to describe her judicial philosophy. Her methodology is one that promotes fairness, independence, and judicial restraint. 
It's reflected in her decision making. In short, Judge Jackson showed us that she's committed to equal justice under the law and ensuring the Constitution works for all Americans, not just the wealthy and powerful. I was also impressed with her judicial temperament. On the whole, my Republican colleagues, starting with my ranking member, Senator Grassley, treated the nominee with dignity and respect. They promised not to turn this confirmation process into a, quote, circus, and most kept that promise. Some, however, did not. Instead, they repeatedly interrupt and badger Judge Jackson and accused her of vile things in front of her parents, her husband, and her children. There was table pounding, some literal, from a few of my colleagues. They repeated discredited claims about Judge Jackson's record. They impugned her motives and questioned her candor. One all but called her a liar. They even suggested that Judge Jackson, a mother to two wonderful daughters, quote, endangers children. Judge Jackson is a better person than me. She stayed calm and collected. She showed dignity, grace, and poise. It is unfortunate that some moments in our hearing came to that. But if there is one positive to take away from these attacks on her, it is that the nation saw the temperament of a good, strong person ready to serve on the highest court of the land. President Biden assured the American public he would select a nominee who is, quote, worthy of Justice Breyer's legacy of excellence and decency, someone extremely well qualified, with a brilliant legal mind, with the utmost character and integrity. Judge Jackson herself characterized Justice Breyer's legacy as one of, quote, the highest level. And that's what we saw in this room last week. Rather than simply another Justice Breyer, she will be the one and only Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. And Justice Jackson will bring to the Supreme Court the highest level of skill, integrity, civility, and grace. Throughout its history, this Senate Judiciary Committee has been the venue for some of our nation's most significant issues, debates, and nominees. I've often thought that if you had to choose one place to stand and witness the march of America, the noble and ignoble struggles of our democracy, I would seek out a chair in this room. Today's vote is such a moment. This committee's action today is nothing less than making history. I'm honored to be part of it. I will strongly and proudly support Judge Jackson's nomination. And now turn to Ranking Member Grassley for his opening remarks. Yeah. We have six judicial nominees, one executive nominee. I'll be supporting Jennifer Reardon. Ms. Reardon has spent her career litigating at some of the best law firms in the country. She's familiar with the types of cases in the Southern District of New York. Finally, Take a few minutes to discuss Ju Judge Jackson's nomination. Judge Jackson, of course, was very personal and engaging. I enjoyed the opportunity to meet her family before the hearing started. We obviously are, they obviously are, and should be proud of her achievements. Having carefully studied her record, unfortunately, I think she and I have fundamental different views on the role of judges and the role that they should play in our system of government. Because of those disagreements, I can't support her nomination. Over the last several weeks, I've talked about how the White House and Democrats have shielded important parts of Judge Jackson's record. We don't have any non-public documents from her time at the Sentencing Commission. The Obama White House held back more than 48,000 pages. Judge Jackson also gave the White House confidential non-public probation recommendations for some of her cases. But last week, we asked for other documents having to do with probation filing in the Hawkins case. Judge Jackson told us that she can't get records for her old cases because of, uh, she's no longer a district court judge. That seems to be very convenient. However, it is a big inconvenience for this senator. The refusal tells us that those documents probably uh, would, wouldn't help the nominee, uh, nominee because we've seen the willingness to leak any helpful information. 
So senators have to make a decision on our nomination based on the information we have. As I said, when this all started, we would thoroughly examine her record uh, and judicial philosophy. We've done both. In the last few weeks, we've heard the remarkable arguments from Democrats that we shouldn't consider a nominee's judicial philosophy in voting. Democrats have themselves to blame. After vicious, misleading attacks on Judge Bork and other conservatives, Republicans didn't use those same tactics against uh, uh, nominees of Clinton, Ginsburg, and Berger, and Breyer. Then, you know the history. Senator Schumer decided to bring back a tax on judicial nominees based on judicial philosophy and also on ideology. In a June 2001 op-ed, Senator Schumer pointed to Bork's nomination and argued it would be good to return to, quote, a more open and rational debate about ideology when we consider nominees, end of quote. He clearly thought the Bork nomination was a good model. Over the next few years, Senator Schumer put his Bork strategy to practice. In 2003, he even said he was proud of his role in blocking nominees based on ideology. So a question to Senator Schumer, 18 years later, are you still proud that you, um, that you, uh, that you poisoned the water uh, on judicial nominees? Now, he and other Democrats think it's unfair that we looked at Judge Jackson's record and asked her about it. That doesn't hold up to even the slightest scrutiny. Senator Schumer and Democrats decided to destroy the model of deference if a nominee was qualified, excluding considerations of their philosophy. In other words, Ginsburg and Breyer uh, are models for that, and they uh, don't think that's a good model. So that's why judicial philosophy has focused on judicial nominations. Now, at one point in written question to her, Senator Cruz pro posed this question. Please explain, explain in your own words the theory prevalent among members of Founding Fathers' generation that humans possess natural rights that are inherent or inalienable. She seemed to have an understanding of this when she answered by saying the theory that humans possess inherent or inalienable rights is reflected in the Declaration of Independence, which states, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Then in the next question, do you hold a position on whether individual possess natural rights, yes or no. It seems to me what her understanding that she should have easily said, said uh, 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 yes to that. Uh, but she uh, took a position she didn't have a position. So part of having judicial philosophy is having an understanding of the fundamental principles in our Constitution, mm -hmm. natural rights, are part of that system. But as Judge Jackson said in a written response, she does not, quote, hold a position on whether individuals uh, possess natural rights, end of quote. I take issue with this as natural rights are basic to our constitutional system and principles of limited government. Under our Constitution, we're endowed by our Creator. Well, I don't have to repeat that. All other rights are reserved to the people under the Tenth Amendment. Recognizing the principle of limited government is what makes America the exceptional government compared to all others and obviously sets our Constitution apart from all others. When interpreting the laws and the Constitution, understanding the principle of limited government are essential. Otherwise, there would be no checks on the federal government. So you got to, does she have an understanding of the meaning of the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment? 
at her hearing and her meetings with senators. Judge Jackson explained that she does not have a judicial philosophy, instead look at her methodology. She said to look at her cases to see that methodology worked. I did, and I found the results of that methodology alarming when Judge Jackson applied it to the First Step Act. At the hearing, Judge Jackson testified about compassionate release provisions of the act. Senator Cotton walked through the specific cases, that of Keith Young, where Judge Jackson misused a motion for compassionate release to re resentence and, uh, and do it to a dangerous drug kingpin. As the lead author of the First Step Act, I know a thing or two about compassionate release. It's meant to allow elderly inmates and those suffering from terminal illness to petition the court for a sentence reduction. The statute also allows for reduction if the court finds an extraordinary or compelling reason. This is supposed to mean that it's be a rare instance and use it with great discretion, particularly as weighed against the charge, danger to society, and the risk of recidivism. At her hearing, Judge Jackson said that she based her extraordinary and compelling findings on the non-retroactive change in the law. And of course, this is a terrible and dangerous misinterpretation. Congress chose first provision, which provisions of the First Step Act would apply retroactively, and since I'm involved with that legislation, I ought to know. The Senate is currently considering legislation that I co-sponsored with this chairman, Durbin, that makes some of the First Step Act retroactive. But Congress must make that change because the First Step Act didn't provide for retroactive application in all instances. For instance, retroactivity isn't mentioned once in the Compassionate Release Statute. The relevant sentencing guidelines don't mention retroactivity as an extraordinary and compelling reason either. So Judge Jackson's consideration of applying retroactivity to the First Step Act when it's not explicitly provided is extremely concerning. It's a radical position and it's outside of the confines of law. Judge Jackson's interpretation was so extreme that she got Senator Cotton to even defend the First Step Act. I don't think that's what the White House had in mind when they <laughs> said she was a consensus builder. Uh, the other troubling part about this case is that Judge Jackson gave a different explanation for her reasoning in the sentencing hearing uh, than she did before the committee. She found that Mr. Young's health and COVID were extraordinary and compelling reasons that warned the reduction in the sentence. But the reasons have to just but the reasons have to justify the reduction. Reducing his sentence based on current health conditions and a pandemic, but leaving him in prison for another seven years makes no sense. Here it meant that Judge Jackson got to sentence the defendant to the sentence she wanted to do all along. The compromise that I brokered with Senator Durbin on the First Step Act and many others wouldn't have been possible if we thought that the act as a judge would insert their own views into the law. Decisions like this represent serious separation of power concerns and will make bipartisan work harder in the future. Uh, Young is just one example of Judge Jackson's lenient approach to criminal law and sentencing. She's declined to apply a number of sentencing enhancements Congress put into the sentencing guidelines. I've worked to reform sentencing for nonviolent offenders, but Judge Jackson's approach applies across most areas of criminal law. She has consistently applied minimum sentences for dangerous crime. Another case shows that Judge Jackson can apply her methodology to reach a result that goes against the plain meaning of the statute. The case is Make the Road New York. It uh, involves a question over meaning of statutory provisions to commit a decision about when illegal immigrants are subject to expedited 
removal to Homeland Security's sole and unreviewable discretion. But Judge Jackson concluded she still could still review the agency's decision because this language didn't mean the decision was, quote, committed to agency discretion by law, end of quote. By reaching that strange conclusion, she gave herself the power to oversee Homeland Security's decisions about expedited removal. And of course, the D.C. Circuit reversed this ridiculous ruling. I think there's been bipartisan frustration with how little nominees say and how candid they are in hearings. But Judge Jackson wasn't ready to answer a number of questions other nominees were w willing to answer. One senator asked Judge Jackson about the judicial philosophy for three sitting justices. She said she wasn't familiar or had a hard time to, or didn't have time to research the issue. This is a question asked in almost every interview for interns and law clerks around the country. We don't expect a nominee to say that they will agree with a specific justice 100 percent of the time, but it's not asking too much that a nominee be able to explain the justice's approach to the law and where they might differ. Judge Jackson also said she didn't watch and wasn't familiar with the com uh, Kavanaugh confirmation. That's pretty surprising for a sitting federal judge who worked in the same courthouse as then Judge Kavanaugh. As a member of the committee, it's hard to satisfy everyone. I've had calls to my office complaining about Senator Durb and saying good things about me. And they argue that I didn't say enough about Democrats' treatment of Kavanaugh and Barrett. And then I have Democrats who are saying I was too mean to the nominee. Throughout this process, I focused on thoroughly and fairly assessing Judge Jackson's record. I think I've done that. We need confidence that judges will interpret the law as they're written. Judge Jackson's reinterpretation of law I've, uh, I've helped write doesn't give me that confidence. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Leahy. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Durbin. And I will also say nice things about you. Uh, uh, Senator Grassley and I have both been chairs of this committee, and you run the committee through this difficult time very well. Uh, I do have a statement before I begin. I, I constantly hear the name of former Judge Bork coming up, and uh, as one of those who was here for the Bork hearings, I do remember what was described as a confirmation conversion as he changed his position uh, dramatically during the hearings. I know that uh, when it was coming to, uh, it came to a vote, he did not pass the committee. Uh, as we all know, the White House was quietly trying to get him to withdraw his name, but the Democratic controlled Senate said if he wanted a vote, we'd have a vote on the Senate floor even if he didn't make it to the committee. He did have a vote on the Senate floor. There were at least a couple of Democrats who voted for him. There were so many Republicans who voted against him, he lost. Had all the Republicans voted for him, he would have won. But I think a number of the Republicans felt the same way that the White House quietly did. The name should have been withdrawn. It makes a nice slogan, but I think It'd be wise if we use the honest history. But now we are going to undertake one of our most consequential duties, to consider and vote whether to advance a nominee to the United States Supreme Court. Our nominee, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson, in my mind embodies the highest ideals of our judiciary and the legal profession. During the confirmation proceedings, she put on a master class about what it means to be an independent, fair-minded justice. Her grace, intellect, temperament, wit are exactly what Americans want and deserve on our nation's highest court. I will proudly and confidently vote aye to advance her historic nomination to the uh, U.S. Senate. This is my 21st 
Supreme Court confirmation process. I voted to confirm Supreme Court nominees nominated by Republican and Democratic presidents alike. I think I voted for more Republican nominated uh, nominees to the Supreme Court than many of my Republican colleagues on this panel. I voted against party lines even when it's not popular to do so. And I've always approached the consideration of Supreme Court nominees in the same manner, with an open and objective mind, giving weight to the qualifications, temperament, and record of the individual who's been nominated. That's because I've always believed and still do that our independent judiciary should be above partisan politics. Now, when I say Judge Jackson is one of the most objectively well-qualified Supreme Court nominees I've ever considered, it is rooted in decades of experience in evaluating these nominees. I know that's going to fall on deaf ears with some members of this committee, members who unfortunately cared more about seeing their sound bites on the social media fields than on seriously and respectfully questioning the nominees. Members who badgered Judge Jackson refused to let her answer questions, even refused to respect basic rules and decorum of the committee and the Senate. The fact that Judge Jackson maintained a calm demeanor and confidence in the face of such disrespectful behavior underscores her remarkable temperament. That's an attribute we need on our nation's highest court. But I hope there are other senators, those to whom I give great credit for asking serious questions and treating the nominee with respect, who will see this historic moment for what it is, a chance to unite across party lines around one of the most brilliant legal minds in our country, just as we did three times before, three times before on our previous confirmation. Now, a chance to elevate the first ever black woman to the Supreme Court, widening the lens of our Supreme Court's representation, ensuring that our democracy's institutions become ever more inclusive and representative with each generation. Also a chance to show Americans that the independence and integrity of our judiciary is something that we need and that we value more than our party affiliations. What a reaffirming signal it would send to the American people if we break free from the politics of the moment and unite behind Judge Jackson. What a refreshing departure that would be from the tired tribalism that's infected virtually every corner of our political system. Judge Jackson has given me every reason to be hopeful, not only for our court, but for our country. Just ja Judge Jackson, just in being nominated, has already helped move our country forward. Millions of people across the country tuned into our hearings. They saw themselves as part of our democratic process like they never had before. That's something we should all be proud of, something we should all strive for in our system of self-government. Now, I'm a former chair of this committee. I'm president pro tem. I'm the dean of the Senate. I continue to hope that we'll be an aspirational committee and that the Senate can still serve as the conscience of the nation, as we often have before in key moments. So let's put partisanship and pettiness aside. Vote to advance this extraordinary nominee, Judge Jackson to the Senate floor, would I in ultimately confirming her to the United States Supreme Court. And realize we are in the midst of an historic moment. The history books will be taking notes. People will read this history for generations to come. And the only question we have is whether we who rise to meet this moment in history. I intend to. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Senator Leahy. Senator Graham. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what would be odd in this committee is for us all not to vote against the Supreme Court nominee, since Gorsuch anyway. So Gorsuch, Alito, Amy Comet, Barrett, Kavanaugh, not one vote. 
uh, about this hearing. Um, Judge Jackson has got a lot to be proud of. She's accomplished a lot in her life. She's a good person. I'm sure she's a great mother and um, very gifted uh, person. She's fought hard to be where she's at in life. I'll vote no. I'm the first, first time I've ever voted against any Supreme Court nominee. Let me tell you how I got there. Number one, the Supreme Court is different than the Circuit Court. I voted for her at the uh, D.C. Circuit Court level because I'm disposed to do that. And I'm playing a game that very few people play anymore, that if you win an election, I expect you to pick somebody I wouldn't support uh, on the court. That just sort of comes with winning. So I didn't think twice about not voting for her. But now that you're talking about the Supreme Court, uh, you're making policy, not just bound by it. And a lot of my friends on the other side have done this, voted for a person at the district court level, the circuit court level, only to vote no at the Supreme Court level. Uh, this nomination had a political moment. President Biden can choose anybody he wants. That comes with winning. He had a lot of qualified African-American women to choose from. To me, saying up front during the election, I'm going to pick a qualified African-American woman is fine. Our folks have done that. Didn't bother me that much. Uh, it was trying to make the court look more like, like America. So he has a political decision he made. I respected that. Now, all of us are in politics over here. Uh, again, I'm inclined to vote for judges of the other side. Uh, but this choice of Judge Jackson was really embraced by the most radical people in the Democratic movement, to the exclusion of everybody else. After four days of hearing, I, hearings, I now know why the left likes her so much. It became obvious to me why she was their first and apparently only choice. So there are people that President Biden could have picked that would have been in the liberal camp in terms of voting on the Supreme Court, uh, and they could have gotten 60 to 65 votes. The White House didn't go down that road because it feels that they must pick somebody that's more appealing to the hard left. They made that choice, and we'll see how it plays out. So why am I voting no? On our side, we, we like judges to be bound by the written letter of the law. The immigration case uh, that got to be sort of famous here, let's see, what was it? Make the Road, New York, et al. versus McAleen was a decision by President Trump and his team to fully utilize expedited removal procedures within the statutory authority granted by Congress. You couldn't have written this thing more clear that it's in the sole and unreviewable discretion of the secretary to use expedited uh, deportation involving people who've been here two years or less. Judge Jackson ruled for the Arabella-funded, supported plaintiff. I think this was probably a tryout for her. And uh, she was overruled by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals not exactly the bastion of conservatism. There could hardly be a more definitive expression of congressional intent to lead the decision about the scope of expedited removal within statutory bounds to the secretary's independent judgment. The forceful phrase, sole and unreviewable discretion by, by its exceptional terms, heralds Congress's judgment to commit the decision exclusively to agencies' discretion. Well, she took the clean, uh, plain meaning of the statute, set it aside, did a legal gymnastics to basically issue a temporary injunction. That, to me, says everything I need to know about how she's going to govern. She's, she wants the outcome. She's going to find it. She's going to get it. Activist to the core. Uh, the child pornography cases. Didn't know much about it until we sort of had the hearing about the way I questioned her. I found if I'd left it up to her, I'd have gotten one answer in 30 minutes. So I don't know how you question witnesses. I interrupt when I think they're being evasive. I let them talk when I think they're answering the question. But this hearing is coming to end. If you compare this to Kavanaugh, you've missed a lot. I've never complained about Kavanaugh or anybody else being asked a hard question. I have complained about their lives being destroyed by a coordinated effort of Democrats and the mainstream media trying to destroy somebody to keep the seat open. That didn't happen here. So I found her completely evasive. But when you did dig into it after a lot of digging, you found out something, I found out something that was astonishing. 
Uh, in the area of child pornography cases, it's not so much that she is out of sync with the average sentence, which she is, and Senator Cruz, you did a great job proving that. Senator Hawley, you dug into her philosophy about how you sentence somebody, and I'm glad you did. What I found was that she routinely sets aside two enhancement factors when it comes to increasing sentence. She will not, as a general policy disagreement with respect to these two enhancements, that is computers and the number of images, she does not hold that against the defendant, the perpetrator. I couldn't disagree more. And if you're a judge out there coming before this committee and you want to get promoted, you have this philosophy, you're going to run into a problem with me. There are 85 million images of children being exploited on the Internet. The statute was written to deal with mail, where child pornographers were mail images of children. Along comes the Internet, as she said. Now it's so easy in the confines of your office or your home to hit a button and download hundreds if not thousands of images, and she felt like that would be unfair to the defendant. I don't. Every time you hit a button downloading an image of a child being sexually abused, I want you to go to jail longer, because every time you hit a button, you're destroying a life. I think she's at this completely backwards. I think you should be enhancing the sentence. The more you download, the more you go to jail. And if you don't do that, we're never going to get this right. And she doesn't hold it against the defendant to go to the venue of choice. I want to deter people from going to the Internet and downloading a bunch of child porn by putting them in jail longer, not less. The fact that she took those two sentencing enhancements off the table because she thought it'd be unfair to the defendant because it's so easy, to me, she just lost me completely in this area. I'm not suggesting she likes what's happening in child pornography. She's not offended. I'm sure she is. I'm sure she's seen a lot of things that offends her, but she's a judge. She has a chance to deter the crime. She has a chance to impose a sentence uh, that would deter it, and she chose not to. I think that is a ter terribly bad choice. And this committee, if anything comes out of this hearing constructively, is that we will pass a law changing that so every judge has to hold it against a child pornographer. The more you download, the longer you go to jail should be the rule. And we should insist that using the Internet is a bad thing in child pornography, uh, not a neutral thing. So I'll like to work with my colleagues on both sides to do that. Now about her being the first African-American nominee before this committee of the Supreme Court. That's true. And the reason that's true is because of what y'all did to Janice Rogers Brown. The only reason that's true is because my Democratic colleagues back in 2005 filibustered for two years, 2003 to 5, Janice Rogers Brown, a Supreme Court Justice from the state of California that was picked by President Bush to be on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeal, the same court that I voted for Judge Jackson. It's kind of a one level below the Supreme Court. And for two years, there was a wholesale uh, filibuster of her. And when it got to be possible for her to be on the Supreme Court as a possibility, then Senator Biden said she would be filibustered. Senator Durbin, Senator... Uh, Schumer all filibustered her and told this body that if you pick her, she's likely to be filibustered. That's why Judge Jackson is the first African-American nominee to come before this body to be on the Supreme Court, because you made it that way. Because when you had a chance to support an African-American conservative, you used her ideology against her. You blocked her from being considered by this committee. And we're supposed to be like trained seals over here clapping when you appoint a liberal. That's not going to work. We live in America today where your ideology is held against you if you're a conservative. And when you're a liberal, we're supposed to embrace everything about you and not ask hard questions. That's not the world we're going to live in. And I'll say this. If we get back the Senate and we're in charge of this body, and there's judicial openings, we will talk to our colleagues on the other side, but if we're in charge, she would not have been before this committee. You would have had somebody more moderate than this. So I want you to know right now, the process you started to go to a simple majority vote is going to rear its head here pretty soon, where we're in charge. Then we'll talk about judges differently. Thank you, Senator Graham. Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. 
Uh, I'm very pleased that the committee is moving forward with our consideration of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. And I want to tell you why. I find that she's an exceptional nominee with impeccable credentials. She has broad and relevant experience and a clear record of well-reasoned legal decisions from her nine years on the federal bench. Now, where do I get this? She has been before us three times already, receiving bipartisan support to serve first on the Sentencing Commission in 2010, as a federal district court judge in 2013, and as a federal appellate court judge in 2021. She has been tested. And based on her record and the testimony, I believe she's again deserving of full support. She is precisely the type of nominee that senators on both sides of this aisle should want on the Supreme Court. First, she applies a clear and fair method in deciding her cases, has demonstrated a remarkable judicial temperament. She faithfully applies the law in each case. In her eight years as a federal district court judge, she had the very low reversal rate of only 2%, which is well below the national average. And it's especially impressive because she served on the D.C. District Court, which hears very challenging issues, many of which end up at the Supreme Court. During the hearings, we heard testimony from retired Judge Thomas Griffith, who was appointed to the D.C. Circuit by President George W. Bush. Judge Griffith told us that Judge Jackson, and I quote his words, will adjudicate based on the facts and the law and not as a partisan. He testified he had, quote, always respected her careful approach, extraordinary judicial understanding, and collegial manner, end quote. We heard similar comments from representatives of the American Bar Association, judges, attorneys who have worked with her over the course of her career. They testified that Judge Jackson is universally and highly regarded for her intellect, her integrity, her judgment, and her writing and analytical skills. Both prosecutors and defense attorneys have praised Judge Jackson, and I quote, as thorough, hardworking, and extremely well prepared. Judge Jackson is widely respect respected, and it's clear to me that her colleagues on the bench and the lawyers who argued before her have no doubt that she would make a fine addition to the Supreme Court. So I have no doubt either. It's clear to me that Judge Jackson believes it's the role of a judge to serve as an impartial decision maker. And as a judge, she considers the facts and the law for each particular case that comes before her to arrive in an outcome that's fair and under the law. I am very proud to support her nomination. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Senator Cornyn. Justice Robert Jackson famously said that the Supreme Court is not final because it's infallible. It's infallible only because it's final. And I trust that would not be the case if the American people saw the Supreme Court as just another political branch. In simple terms, it means that the Supreme Court is the last word in interpreting and applying our laws through the 70 to 80 cases it decides to hear each year. Mainly because it's seen as an umpire, not as a player. While I view the judicial branch as the crown jewel of our constitutional republic, it has over the years gotten out of its lane on more than one occasion by acting like another political branch. Over the years, the Supreme Court has developed various legal doctrines like substantive due process to create new rights out of whole cloth, rights that are neither in the text nor 
would the framers ever envision that these rights existed or would be created by nine unelected judges at the time of the founding? By vesting federal power in Article I, federal legislative power in Article I, and then reserving to the states to determine their own affairs, our founders believed that policy decisions must reside ultimately in the people. As senators, we work on our constituents' behalf here in Washington, and every six years, they let us know whether we're doing a good job or not. When the Supreme Court blatantly engages in policymaking, it takes away the power of the people to decide for themselves and to hold their government accountable. Agree or disagree with the results of a given Supreme Court decision. Over our nation's history, there have been, there's been something for everyone to love or hate, from Plessy versus Ferguson, which established the shameful separate but equal doctrine for public schools, ultimately overruled in Brown versus Board of Education, to Obergefell, which mandated same-sex marriages. When the Supreme Court creates a right that is not even mentioned in the Constitution, the independence and the legitimacy of the Supreme Court itself is called into question because consent is discarded. Legitimacy of our government institutions is something we have always debated in America, and we've even fought a war over it. The Declaration of Independence itself affirms that government derives its just powers from the consent of the governed. That very principle is undermined when judges rewrite the Constitution to their liking. Where is the legitimizing consent? President Lincoln stated it another way. He said, no man is good enough to govern another man without that man's consent. How are these so-called unenumerated rights, you might call them naked to the, invi to the uh, invisible to the naked eye, how are those rights any different? That is what can happen when unelected judges invalidate state laws and impose a one-size-fits-all policy regime on our entire country. Again, like or dislike the results in an individual case, but we should all be concerned about the legitimacy of our governing institutions when they so readily discard consent of the governed. I view the confirmation proceedings as a way to get back and reflect on first principles, on the role of our judiciary in our constitutional system. President Biden has made no bones about his intention to nominate a Supreme Court justice who has an expansive view of unenumerated invisible rights. Judge Jackson? Well, she wouldn't answer our questions on this topic. I didn't ask her to prejudge a case or commit to a particular outcome in a, in a disputed area of law, but I did ask her about her judicial philosophy. She says she doesn't have one and hasn't thought much about it. That's simply not a credible response, and I believe demonstrates a lack of candor. Maybe she was overcoached, but I left the confirmation hearings concerned about her approach to unwritten rights. Judge Jackson has a marvelous legal education. She's a charming person. She has a vast practical experience, something I think is a, is a real plus, having served as a public defender, a federal district judge, and a circuit court judge, and not just an academician. Someone of her impressive caliber surely has a judicial philosophy, but maybe she just didn't want to talk about it. Time after time, when we asked about her judicial philosophy, she pivoted to something she called methodology. But let me be clear, methodology is not a judicial philosophy. I'm glad when she tells us that she proceeds from a place of neutrality, but that tells us nothing as to whether she believes that the Constitution has a fixed meaning. The order in which she decides to read the party's briefs tells us nothing as to whether and to what extent a judge, now quoting Justice Breyer, her mentor, will look to consequences including contemporary conditions, social, industrial, and political of the community affected when deciding cases. 
Now, the main types of contrasting judicial philosophies include judicial activism versus judicial restraint, loose construction versus strict construction, and a living document approach versus original intent. Justice Barrett, for example, called herself an originalist and a textualist, an approach championed by her mentor, Justice Scalia. That would place her in the judicial restraint and strict constructionist camp. In other words, she might be skeptical of invisible or unenumerated rights. For us to fulfill our constitutional duties, we need answers to our questions about how a judge views judge-made law. My concerns were further elevated as I reviewed Judge Jackson's record and I saw examples of activism bleeding over in her decisions. One of the opinions from her time on the D.C. court demonstrates the serious concerns I have about her ability to follow the clear letter of the law as opposed to her personal preferences. Others have mentioned, and I will as well, the case of Make the Road New York versus McAleenan, where the American Civil Liberties Union and others challenged a regulation requiring expedited removal for people who illegally enter our country. The Immigration Nationality Act gives the Department of Homeland Security, and I quote, sole and unreviewable discretion to apply expedited removal proceedings. That does not leave any gray area for interpretation. Sole and unreviewable discretion is about as clear as it comes. But Judge Jackson, who presided over this case, decidedly did not stay in her lane, as she says she attempts to do. She went beyond this unambiguous text to deliver a political win to a progressive group and in the process entered an injunction barring the use of this important tool that's needed by our Border Patrol and immigration authorities to deter people from violating our immigration laws. Unsurprisingly, as we've heard, her decision was overruled by the D.C. Circuit Court. I believe this is a clear-cut example, about as clear as you can possibly get, of Judge Jackson ignoring the written law in order to achieve a result that she preferred. There have only been 115 Supreme Court justices in our nation's history. That's why it's crucial that we use these proceedings to understand if a judge will truly stay in their lane or whether they will attempt to legislate from the bench and deliver what Justice Biden and his Democratic colleagues are unable to achieve through the legislative process. A judge must call balls and strikes. And given what I've seen and her unwillingness to disclose her judicial philosophy and a disavow and expansionist view of unenumerated rights, I have concerns that Judge Jackson will be pinch hitting for one team or the other. I will vote no. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. What uh, plays out here in this room with Supreme Court nominations is often driven and uh, directed in other places. And um, the real action is too often off stage in an archipelago of right wing, dark money front groups out to capture the court. That is where the real story lies. When Republicans appoint to the Supreme Court, the selections, the selections come out of that archipelago of front groups, paid for by big anonymous donors, what we call dark money. When Democrats appoint to the Supreme Court, their objections come out of that same archipelago of front groups paid for by big anonymous donors, the dark money groups. We have heard a lot about judicial philosophy during the course of this. Well, if you bring a judicial philosophy to these proceedings, I think we do need to examine it because a judicial philosophy is so often a mask for predispositions. Originalism works very nicely for you if you'd like to look back before the civil rights movement in making decisions about civil rights. Originalism works very well for you if you'd like to look back before industry regulation at a time when there was no industry big enough to regulate and serve the interests of corporate deregulation. And originalism works very well for you if you want to return to old 
social norms that society has moved beyond. So let's not pretend that a judicial philosophy is a neutral thing. It is a tool, and when a judge says he or she has one, it's worth looking into. But that doesn't mean you have to have one. There's a group called the Independent Women's Law Center, which, like many of these right-wing front groups, is twinned with another group, which is called Independent Women's Voice. One is the 501c3, one is the 501c4. Their funders are Leonard Leo's 85 Fund and Concord Fund, another pair of 501c3, 501c4 twins at the heart of the court capture scheme. They're also funded by the Koch and Bradley Foundations, who I've talked about before in these proceedings. Indeed, for years, the president of one of these groups was actually a Koch Industries lobbyist and overlapped for a while with Americans for Prosperity, the Koch brothers' huge dark money political operation. And they, on February 24th, before they even knew who the nominee was going to be, sent a memo to GOP Senate members. Ray suggested SCOTUS talking points. Date, February 24th, 2022. Here's the punchline. It is therefore important that you focus not on the selection process or on the nominee's paper qualifications, but rather on the need to learn more about the nominee's judicial philosophy. Ask unanimous consent that the memo from those two front groups be put into the record. Without objection. The other theme we hear a lot about is how this judge was going to be dangerous for children. And once again, we turn to a right-wing dark money front group as the source for that concern. Um, on the day of her announcement, February 25th, a group called the American Accountability Foundation came out with an investigative report. Now, let's look at the American Accountability Foundation. It shares an address and senior staff with a group called the Conservative Partnership Institute, which employs, among other people, that wonderful Cleta Mitchell as a senior legal fellow. Indeed, the Conservative Partnership Institute is the so-called care of name in the filings of the American Accountability Foundation. And it also shares an address with something called America First Legal. American Accountability Foundation is funded by Donors Trust, which is described as the Koch brothers' right-wing ATM, and the Bradley Foundation, which I've, again, spoken about before in this hearing in this context. And it was founded by the opposition research director of none other than Cruz for President. So they got right to work the day she was announced. And AAF founder Tom Jones said, after calling her a radical leftist, which I guess they figured out that very first day she was announced, uh, Americans want our judicial system to protect children and citizens from sexual predators. I'm ask unanimous consent that that dark money release be put into the record. Without objection. So the continuing problem of these outside groups that are funded by huge interests that hide who's behind them and that exert control when Republicans are in charge in the selection of the nominees and when Democrats are in charge in the objections to the nominees is something that I think needs to be brought to the surface. So I wanted to make that point with those two arguments. I'd also like to point out, just because I've been a prosecutor and seen some of this stuff, um, and spoken to Rhode Island judges, federal judges, about this. I'm told that the two most disfavored guidelines in the entire sentencing scheme are the crack powder cocaine disparity and the pornography possession guidelines. And that's widely accepted throughout the judiciary, which we've heard from many other members of the judiciary. And that would help explain why, in so many of these cases, the government actually recommends below the sentencing guidelines. The government, which usually is making the harshest sentencing recommendation, is actually recommending below the sentencing guidelines. 
It's hard to fault the judge for a sentence below the sentencing guidelines when the harshest participant in the courtroom, the government, is recommending below the sentencing guidelines. And as those of us who've been there know, every judge faces three data points in a sentencing hearing. One is the position of the government. The second is the position of the defense. And by the way, in our system of justice, the judge is pretty much honor bound to give fair consideration to the recommendation of the defense. You can't rule out the defense's recommendation just because they're representing the defendant. They're entitled to an honest consideration of their views. And then there's the probation office, which serves the court and makes its own recommendation based on an exhaustive personal review of the defendant, of the family, of the victims, of the circumstances, and comes up with a sentencing recommendation. And when you look at all three of those data points that a judge has to face, and when you look at the widespread acceptance of the fact that this particular sentencing guideline is widely thought across the judiciary to have a serious problem with it, and you actually look at where these sentences fall in that actual matrix, there is nothing to see here. This is all part of what was cooked up by the former opposition research director for one of our colleagues, this uh, dark money funded uh, American Accountability Foundation. Uh, with that, I think it's unfortunate what she had to go through. I think what's really unfortunate is whoever's behind all this nonsense doesn't just stand up and show who they are. Admit it. Show who wrote the check to the Judicial Crisis Network for $15 million or $17 million. It's a pretty big check to write. Who wrote that check to get the ads up on the air for Kavanaugh? Who wrote that check to get the ads up on the air for Gorsuch? Who wrote that check to get the ads up on the air for Barrett? And what business did they have before the court that caused them to write checks that big? That is a mystery that we need to solve. There's been a lot of criticism of dark money on all sides of the panel here during the course of this discussion. Well, everybody's going to have a nice chance to prove it in the months ahead when we bring up the Disclose Act for a vote and we're given the opportunity to get rid of this poisonous stuff for once and for all. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I appreciated the willingness <clears throat> of Judge Jackson <clears throat> to come before our committee and answer questions. I've enjoyed getting to know her. She seems, she seems like a wonderful human being, uh, uh, one who's dedicated to her family, she comes with some impressive qualifications academically and professionally. She's someone who's clerked at all three levels of the federal judiciary and if confirmed, will have served at all three levels of the federal judiciary. Itself a significant and valuable experience. It is important to understand what kind of Supreme Court justice she would be. And that's why this, this can't be something that simply focuses on the historic nature of the nomination. Uh, by the way, on that point, uh, as to the historic nature of the, of the nomination, uh, earlier today, uh, there was a, a Politico tweet. P Politico sent out a tweet uh, reading as follows, saying, Ketanji Brown Jackson will likely be confirmed as the first black Supreme Court justice by the end of this week. Here's how we expect it to go. Now, <clears throat> if that were true, that would come as news to uh, uh, the, the family of Thurgood Marshall. And it would come as great news to Justice Clarence Thomas and his family. When we hear, as we've heard today, calls for um, and making sure that we respect uh, the need to show inclusiveness. Uh, let's remember how uh, members of this committee, committee have treated others. Let's remember how they treated Justice Clarence Thomas. Let's remember how they're still treating Justice Clarence Thomas, how people on the left are savagely attacking him. One of the most decent human beings that I've ever known, one of the most decent human beings and, and uh, brilliant jurists ever to serve. 
on the Supreme Court of the United States, or any court for that matter. Let's remember how members of this committee and people on the left treated Janice Rogers Brown and Miguel Estrada. So <clears throat> if you're going to make it about inclusiveness, let's remember to be inclusive in our discussion of inclusiveness. It's also important to talk about judicial philosophy. There's a reason we talk about it that. We, we talk about it not just because it's, it's jargon that makes us feel good or there's some sort of comfort food. We talk about it because we must talk about it because that's how we make sure that our government functions as it should. When you have someone serving on any federal court, but especially the Supreme Court of the United States, if they don't have a, a proper understanding for the limited role of the federal judiciary for the separation of powers between the three branches, a judicial branch can become very dangerous, in which the will of the people can be thwarted uh, uh, by uh, justices who are, are not willing to recognize limits on their own power, limits on their own jurisdiction. Judges and justices who can't recognize what they're empowered to do and that their role uh, is not a policy-making one, but an interpretive one. That's why we ask so many questions about judicial philosophy. For a judge that wants to achieve a particular outcome, for a, a judge who looks at, at a case from the standpoint of figuring out what result he or she would be comfortable with, then that becomes the judicial philosophy. The, the achievement of a fair result, of a result that the judge of justice feels comfortable with, is the guiding principle. But judicial philosophy matters also because there are a lot of consequences to having a bad judicial philosophy. Now, <clears throat> when we asked about uh, Judge Jackson's judicial philosophy. When we asked her, when we asked others, we, we were told frequently that um, we should look at her record. So we looked at her record. <clears throat> We've got a lot of things in her record that we found concerning, including a couple of cases in, in which she acted without jurisdiction. The Make, Make the Road New York case is a troubling example of this as is the uh, AF, AFGE uh, versus Trump case. In both circumstances, she took an executive action taken within the Trump administration, action that she apparently disagreed with, and issued declaratory and injunctive relief to invalidate those actions. And in both cases, she was overturned by the left-leaning U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. These cases haven't gotten as much attention as some of her other rulings, as some of her sentencing decisions, but they're very, very significant. They're deeply troubling to me because when someone's willing to act when they lack jurisdiction and or when they don't have a valid cause of action upon which to grant that relief, that's someone who's cutting at the heart of the limits on judicial authority and creating a dangerous set of circumstances. So we're told to look at her record, and yet much of what we see from her record is disturbing. We're told to look at her record, and yet we still don't have significant portions of her record on another disturbing line of rulings, those dealing with her sentencing imposed in child pornography cases. Now, she uh, uh, made the argument, and, and uh, many on this committee have made the argument for her as well, that, um, you know, all judges sentenced this far out of the guidelines, as far out of the guidelines as she did in those cases, as if she were somehow within the mainstream of, of judges on uh, sentencing cases like these. But based on what we've seen, she sentences 47 percent below the national average. Then just three days ago and over a week after the hearings were concluded, we received the sentencing transcripts from a case where Judge Jackson gave yet another light sentence to a violent child rapist who failed uh, uh, to give truthful information to the court, falsified his address for purposes of requiring a sex offender registry
participation. In this instance, the defendant, Mr. Weeks, sexually assaulted another female family member shortly after being released. He then bribed the victim, apparently, into refusing to testify against him. Mr. Weeks would have been in prison and unable to sexually assault his sister-in-law if Jackson hadn't sentenced him below the guidelines range and below the government's recommendation. Now, Judge Jackson insists that her, her sentences are based on mitigating factors, those articulated in 18 U.S.C. Section 3553, and that we could understand that if only we had the record before us. Now, for whatever reason, the White House and the Democrats on this committee are, aren't uh, all that concerned about making sure we have that record. And in fact, they seem determined to do the opposite of that. And Judge Jackson puzzlingly claims that she doesn't have access to those records, even though it appears that she, through her chambers, got key pieces of that information that could have been drawn from the pre-sentence reports, which we've requested, and sent sensitive information from those reports over to the White House. Well, something doesn't add up here. So when we ask about her judicial philosophy, we're told to look at her record, and yet when we look at her record, what's there is troubling to us, and very often there's a whole lot that simply isn't there. I'm also concerned about her inability or unwillingness to answer certain basic questions. Whether it's in response to judge, it, whether it, it's in response to a question from Senator Blackburn, a uh, simple question, what is a woman? To her refusal to respond to my question regarding her views on efforts to pack the Supreme Court of the United States. These are troubling, troublingly inadequate answers that she provides because she doesn't answer them at all to very basic questions, questions that she could easily answer, should easily answer, and the fact that she doesn't and won't and hasn't is concerning. Finally, I'm concerned by her response to Senator Kennedy, echoing former Justice Brennan's philosophy that five unelected Supreme Court justices can find new unenumerated constitutional rights. Quote, well, at any time, any time the Supreme Court has five votes, then they have a majority for whatever opinion they determine, close quote. That's troubling. Look, the record doesn't support what they say it, it supports. Even more troublingly, the stuff that they say is supportive of her record, stuff we haven't been given. Why? Why? This is not a vacancy that currently exists on the Supreme Court. There's no reason to rush this. So why not give us access to the documents that we need, documents that she insists maintain and defend the sentences she issued in those cases, very often dif disregarding, in whole or in part, sentencing enhancements for child pornography offenders. Not just child pornography, let's call this what it is. This is commercialized, these are commercialized efforts to profit off of child sex torture. Enhancements for uh, computer transmission and receipt, for number of images, for prepubescent victims, and for sadomasochistic conduct carried out in those very often dismissing or minimizing those enhancements simply because she disagrees with certain key policy element, elements underlying them. This is troubling, and we don't even have the pre-sentence reports and the other documents we need to review them. I will vote no. Thank you, Senator Lee. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to start out by thanking you and uh, Senator Grassley for your leadership. Senator Grassley, when you mentioned uh, going home the first day and your wife saying the thing she liked best at the hearing was Judge Jackson's opening statement, thank you for setting that tone um, and for sharing that story. And you, Senator Durbin, 
uh, having to chair this, I was remembering Justice Roberts' uh, line that he was, as a judge, his, he would be calling balls and strikes. And I was thinking you had to do a lot more than that. You have to call wild pitches and foul balls. And as spring training starts, this is all on my mind. Um, you have to uh, take a lot of curveballs. Um, but what you did for all of us, for both teams, uh, was to remind us uh, why we are here. Uh, democracy uh, brought us here. And uh, this isn't just our ballpark or our playing field. Uh, this is America's ballpark. Uh, this is America's court. And thank you so much for that. Um, on the first day of Judge Jackson's hearing, um, I talked about how the fact that she was here to open things up. We were literally open things up. This is the first hearing where we've had uh, guests um, because of the pandemic. And as we emerge from that, uh, we see a nominee, a judge, who will walk into that court with her head held high because she is opening up that court to make every little girl and boy in America to realize that anything and everything is possible. And as Senator Booker so beautifully reminded us uh, last week, this is a moment of joy. Uh, she is truly an inspiration to young black girls uh, like DC resident Maddie Morgan. I was on a walk and her dad, I didn't know him, jumped out of a car because he saw me walking to bring a letter to me that she had written the President of the United States, 11 years old, and she asked President Biden that she be considered uh, when he was looking for justices. Uh, she pointed out that with her age, she could remain on the court for at least 80 years. Um, her argument was uh, that she wanted to be the voice for children. Um, and she said, I live a few blocks away from the Supreme Court, so it will be easy for me to get there. Uh, after the president made his nomination of Judge Jackson, uh, she said, if I'm going to be snubbed, it couldn't be for a better candidate. Um, and she actually was here at the hearing um, to witness history being made. Throughout the hearing, Judge Jackson demonstrated her command of the law and her reverence for the Constitution. Judge Jackson, in fact, as we know, has more judicial experience than four of the nominees of the nominees and now justices had when they came before this committee. Four people who are currently serving on the court. She'll be the first person on the court to be in the room where it happens, where those decisions are made with public defender experience. She knows the importance of public service from her parents, both teachers, and she has that perspective of knowing that life isn't always easy. She's had family members who served in law enforcement. And I think this might be a good moment to get at some of the arguments my colleagues have and will be making. Um, and I think I might be a good person to bring this up because I'm someone that has consistently asked questions of nominees. I always ask about antitrust, even though they don't want me to ask it. I always ask about uh, the First Amendment and some de many detailed questions about starry decisis and the like. And I was the one on this committee that one of the nominees actually apologized to, not for what I did, but what he said. And I want to get at some of the criticisms that we have heard lodged against this great woman. When we hear about this child pornography, what I see, I see a mom who opened up her heart to all of us and explained to all of us how no one can be the perfect mom, no matter how hard you try. I see a woman of deep faith who was questioned about that and explained her deep faith many, many times. Let's look at the facts. In eight of the 11 child pornography cases that Judge Jackson handled, she gave a sentence at or above either the, probate, the probation office recommendations. And when she imposed other sentences, it was because she looked at the case carefully. And by the way, she made her own decision. Maybe not everyone in this room would have agreed with it, but she was being a judge, just like judges that were supported by my colleagues made that decision. I'm not even gonna mention these judges' names that I'm about to talk about because I don't think they should be dragged into this just because they happened to make decisions that were below guidelines. One of them on the Second Circuit, strongly supported by one of our colleagues and commended, said when he sentenced 
a defendant to 60 months. He sentenced a defendant to 60 months, which was 60% lower than the bottom of the guideline range at 151 months. Another one who was complimented on the 11th Circuit by our Republican colleagues. He sentenced a defendant to 84 months, which was 44% lower than the bottom of the guidelines. Here's some Trump nominees, one in the Eastern District of Missouri, who's a judge, sentenced a defendant to 60 months when the guideline range was 135 to 168. Another Trump nominee that was supported by our colleagues, Eastern District of Missouri, sentenced a defendant to 60 months when the guideline range was 78 to 97 months. Another, I will not go on, but they could all have been dragged through the mud too. They could have been dragged through the mud and called names with these kinds of implications. Last week, the committee received a letter from a former federal child exploitation prosecutor in the District of Columbia who wrote that Judge Jackson, quote, had a reputation for carefully considering the circumstances of every case and that former and current prosecutors note that she was thoughtful and individualized in her approach to these cases. And if you really want to go deep into the details here, Senator Cruz released a chart saying the average sentence imposed by Judge Jackson in possession cases, possession of porn, is 29.3 months. But it is based on only four cases and omits one that would raise her average to 52 months, much closer to the reported national average of 60 months. And if you were considering all of her non-production cases, possession, receipt, distribution of pornography, and yes, as a former prosecutor, I know these differences, the average sentence imposed was 65 months. I literally cannot even believe that I'm going into these details, but I am. Last, when we hear about uh, judicial philosophy, let me quote Judge Roberts in his own hearing. He said, well, I have said I do not have an overarching judicial philosophy. I think we heard this great judge and how she's going to decide cases. She's going to decide cases with fairness, and she's going to do the best thing, and she's going to look at the facts, and she's going to look at the law, and she's going to make a decision. She recognizes, as she told me at her hearing, that public confidence in the court is crucial. That's why she's always written such long and transparent decisions to explain to the public her reasoning. She told me about her deep commitment to judicial independence. When I asked her about stare decisis, she said that if there were massive shifts every time a new justice came on or every time new circumstances arose, there would be a concern that public confidence would be eroded. As she put it, stare decisis, looking at the past cases, I'm just paraphrasing that, furthers the rule of law in this country. She is someone that understands and has shown her ability to take on complex matters. But just as importantly, she's someone who understands the real world impact of court's decision. She understands that those words on the page aren't just words. Those words on the page can change people's lives, whether they can get health care what their options are, if they can have clean water and air, even if they're going to be able to vote, when they're going to be able to vote, and how they're going to be able to vote. At this critical moment in our history, Judge Jackson has the qualities to make sure that the court and the Constitution, in Justice Breyer's words, work for the people of today. She will bring to the court her rich experience as a judge, a working mom, a family member who has law enforcement, a child of teachers, a former public defender, and a deeply committed public servant. Her story is a quintessentially American one. And as she put it, her success is, quote, a testament to the hope and promise of this country. Now, it is our duty as senators on this committee to take on that hope and promise of America. And remember, as this day moves forward, and as we hear from our colleagues, and we take this vote, that this is all about that spirit of hope and promise. And let's make Maddie Morgan proud. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
There are a few more consequential decisions the Senate undertakes or this committee undertakes than the nomination and confirmation of Supreme Court justices. Judge Jackson is charming. She's talented. She has an inspiring life story. If she's confirmed, she will be an historic first, the first African-American woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court. I've known Judge Jackson for 30 years. I've always liked her personally. But the assessment this body is charged with the Constitution with making is whether her records demonstrate she will be a justice who will faithfully uphold the Constitution. Now, our Democratic colleagues and their cheerleaders in the corporate media have repeatedly tried to suggest that any opposition to Judge Jackson's nomination is rooted in racism or sexism. There's some irony in that because all of the Democrats on this committee were only so happy to vote against the confirmation of Justice Amy Coney Barrett without facing any concerns about the sexism they were showing. And there's greater irony in Democrats celebrating this historic first because it would have occurred 20 years ago. An African-American woman could have served on the Supreme Court 20 years ago except for fa the fact that Democrats filibustered a qualified African-American woman, Judge Janice Rogers Brown. Indeed, if members of this committee were asked to raise your hand, have you ever filibustered a qualified African-American woman in order to prevent her from going to the U.S. Supreme Court? Three hands would go up. Not on this side of the aisle, but the three most senior Democrats would all be obliged to raise their hand. Also, Joe Biden, if he's at home watching this on C-SPAN, Joe Biden would raise his hand as well. Chuck Schumer would raise his hand as well. So this historic first could have happened a decade ago, but for the unified partisan opposition of Democrats to letting it happen with a judge who was not on the hard left. A number of Democrats complained that there were hard questions asked. Well, that's our responsibility. Every one of the questions focused on her record, her record as a judge, her sentencing record, her academic writings, her speeches to law schools. Not a single Republican senator asked her about her high school yearbook, engaged in the kind of personal slanders that Democrats have made a business about. If the questions were hard, it is because her record is at the extreme. There have been 115 men and women who have served on the Supreme Court. If Judge Jackson is confirmed, I believe she will prove to be the most extreme and the furthest left justice ever to serve on the United States Supreme Court. She will be to the left of Justice Sotomayor. She will be to the left of Justice Kagan, she will be way, way, way to the left of Justice Stephen Breyer. That's why radical leftist groups have pledged to spend over a million dollars supporting her nomination while they demanded the Biden White House pick the furthest left, the most extreme nominee. That's their agenda. Now, our Democratic colleagues like to pretend they don't support the agenda this justice can be predicted to follow. Based on her record, if she is confirmed, I think the odds are virtually 100% that she will vote to overturn Heller versus District of Columbia, which means she will vote to overturn to take away the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms of every individual. If she is confirmed, the odds are Virtually 100%, she will vote to overturn the Citizens United case, which means she will vote to take away the free speech rights of Americans to participate in the political process. If she is confirmed, the odds are nearly 100%, she will vote to strike down every single reasonable restriction on abortion across the country. That includes restrictions on partial birth abortion. That includes requirements for parental notification or consent. If she is confirmed, the odds are nearly 100% she will vote 
to overturn efforts to enforce our nation's borders and to deport those here illegally. The Make the Road case demonstrated her willingness to put left-wing policy above the law. If she is confirmed, the odds are over 100 percent she will vote to give away U.S. sovereignty to international tribunals and international bodies. If she is confirmed, the odds are overwhelming she will vote to undermine our religious liberty and to overturn decisions like Zelman versus Simmons-Harris, the 5-4 landmark decision that upheld school choice. Understand the consequence of this nomination. If she is confirmed, the odds are very, very high she will vote to throw out school choice programs all across this country. And then there's crime. No topic has been the focus of this hearing more than her record on crime. And her record on crime is out of the mainstream. Her record on crime is extreme. Now, our Democratic colleagues have responded with a straw man. They've responded saying, well, judges all over the country sentence below the guidelines. When you look at her record, it's not just below the guidelines, though. In 100% of the child pornography cases where Judge Jackson had discretion, 100%, she sentenced not just below the guidelines, but below where the prosecutor asked, and usually substantially below. But, my colleagues say, everybody does it. That's their defense. Everybody does it. Well, let's look at the facts in, in cr criminal cases nationally. This is all criminal cases nationally. If you compare Judge Jackson's record in criminal cases nationally, her average sentence is 29.9 months. The national average is 45.1 months. So that's all crimes, murder, rape, any, anything that's a crime, all of them in the national statistics, she sentences a third lower than the national average. The Democrats' argument, everybody does it, doesn't withhold, doesn't stand up to the scrutiny, but when you look in particular at child pornography, a topic that is disturbing, the Democrats say, well, gosh, she doesn't like child pornography. Of course she doesn't. No rational person does. It's horrible. My Democratic colleagues go to the, the sen Senate floor and they read from her statements talking about these are not victimless crimes. These are little boys and little girls being horribly, violently assaulted. It stays with them their whole lives. I agree with what she says, but she says that and then turn or turns around and gives the, the defendant, the criminal, a slap on the wrist. And if you look at the records... Possession of child pornography, the national average is 68 months. That's every federal district judge in the country. What is Judge Jackson's average? 29.2 months. She sentenced is 57% lower than the national average, 57%. Even more disturbing, distribution. The national average for distributing child porn, videos of little children being sexually assaulted, the national average is 135 months, 11 years. That's a long sentence because it's a horrible crime. Her average is 71.9 months. That's 47% less, but this is even more striking when you realize that the mandatory minimum for distributing child porn is 60 months, that under federal law, you can't go below 60 months. What that means is that judges across the country on average sentence those distributing child porn to 75 months longer than the mandatory minimum. And Judge Jackson sentences them on average to 11.9 months longer. Now, the Democrats suggest this is cherry-picking. This is based on every single child pornography case she's decided. And by the way, we just last week after the hearing got information on another case, United States versus Weeks, of an individual who raped his 13-year-old niece. Judge Jackson sentenced him to half what the prosecutors wanted because he failed to register on a sex registry and went to work at a daycare while he was released early because of Judge Jackson's sentence. He committed another sexual assault, a rape, 
Again, she had him before her, and again, she sentenced him to half what the prosecutors sought. This is a pattern. Now, Democratic senators like to say they don't want to abolish the police. But I'll tell you what, if Judge Jackson is confirmed, her record demonstrates that it is 100% certain she will vote to overturn the death penalty, and that repeatedly she will vote to overturn strict sentences on violent criminals, to release violent criminals from jail, to overturn strict punishments on sex offenders. And my Democratic colleagues like to say when crime is skyrocketing, when murder rates are skyrocketing, when carjacking is skyrocketing, when sexual assaults are skyrocketing, my Democratic colleagues say, it's not my fault. Well, I'll tell you what. When you vote to confirm justices who release criminals over and over and over again in a way that is wildly out of the mainstream, it is the Democrats' fault. Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member uh, Grassley. Thank you for maintaining, uh, to the extent you can, um, the decorum of these proceedings, a respectful uh, process. Uh, and I am particularly grateful uh, to President Biden for nominating Judge Jackson uh, and to Judge Jackson for her courage and her engagement in this process, which at time has been withering, uh, even abusive. Um, I was impressed by the fact that she was raised by a family committed to service that raised her with a sense of dignity and integrity and um, a very strong sense of self with which she carried herself through uh, what have been uh, some uh, challenging moments here in this committee. I believe the majority of the members of this committee have made uh, a good faith effort to learn about Judge Jackson and her record. And through hours of one-on-one -on -one meetings, an extensive review of her record, uh, and hearing from organizations and advocates nationally, they've come away with a view where they are certain of her both outstanding character and impeccable qualifications. Uh, anyone who watched these hearings uh, saw Judge Jackson uh, give a clinic on judicial temperament and how to conduct oneself in a poised and thoughtful way that I thought um, gave a voice through action of her impeccable character. Um, to be sure, there have been a number of attacks lobbed at Judge Jackson, um, some of them really quite recently, and so I think um, some brief rejoinder uh, may well be worth a few minutes of our time. Uh, Judge Jackson is not far, far from the mainstream. Uh, in fact, uh, in over 250 reviews conducted by the American Bar Association, and that includes uh, judges and prosecutors, defense attorneys, fellow practitioners uh, from her time as a public defender, her time at different law firms, her time on the bench, uh, and her clerkships, um, not one found her far outside the mainstream. Judge Jackson has nothing to do with critical race theory, despite a number of engaging posters. Uh, as she testified and as the record shows, she's never cited or relied upon critical race theory in her nine years on the bench and in her more than 570 written opinions. She is not a radical liberal activist judge, and I don't think any of us should be making proclamations about what we are certain she would do to the trajectory of American law. As all of us who were here for the first day, remember Republican appointed conservative judge Thomas Griffith from the DC circuit testified in front of us that in Judge Jackson's nine years on the district court bench and more than 570 opinions, she demonstrated a diligent and careful approach. As Judge Griffith told us, Judge Jackson is an independent jurist who adjudicates based on the facts and the law and not as a partisan. Judge Jackson is not soft on crime. Uh, I think it is particularly hard to square the fact that two of the largest, best informed, most active law enforcement advocacy organizations in our country, the National Fraternal Order of Police and the International Association of Chiefs of Police, have spoken up in support of her nomination. Um, it is hard to square that with some of the mischaracterizations that have been lobbed in her direction. 
She is from a family dedicated to service to our nation, service as educators, as police officers, her brother who was with us um, serving in the military, people who've devoted their lives to the American cause, to improving and caring for other families and communities. Uh, and she is absolutely not an enabler of child abusers. Um, one conservative prosecutor, Fox News opinion writer, said that these repeated assaults uh, mischaracterizing her entire character and record based on just a few sentencing decisions are meritless to the point of demagoguery. That's an elegant way of saying worthless. Of the 100 offenders she sentenced, there have been just five cases for possession of child pornography, and in every case, she sent the offender to jail. As my colleague from Minnesota ably and thoroughly reviewed, um, she's in the mainstream of judges sentencing in these cases. I'll just add two more pieces of evidence to this ongoing debate, if I might. In ABC News review of federal judges appointed and confirmed during the previous administration, found a dozen had handed down similar below guideline sentences in cases of defendants who were charged with viewing, possessing, transporting, or distributing child pornography. The committee also received a letter uh, from judges, nine retired uh, district court and circuit court judges, retired. Uh, this is affiliated with Harvard Law School. A letter that attests that her practice in sentencing, and let me read if I can, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson's record in individual cases is entirely consistent with the nationwide patterns described by the U.S. Sentencing Commission and with the DOJ prosecutors and U.S. Court Probation Departments recommended. To the extent she departed, it is well within the mainstream of what other judges were doing nationwide by judges appointed by both Republicans and Democrats. Finally, I thought this was in some ways the hardest to understand, Judge Jackson is not going to pack the Supreme Court. There were a whole series of efforts to ascribe to Judge Jackson the views of uh, different advocacy organizations. And as Senator Whitehouse uh, thoroughly, repeatedly, and actively has laid out, um, we have too many groups that are advocating and engaging in trying to pre-cook what our work is here on the Judiciary Committee by digging the backgrounds, by pre-packaging, by advertising, and by selling. We can and should make real progress in opening up these dark money groups by voting for the Disclose Act. If later this year, when we have a chance on the floor of the Senate, my colleagues refuse to vote so that the American people can know who's really funding all this stuff, then they don't really want to know the truth. There's a lot more that I could present this morning to lay out the truth behind all of these aggressive, and I would say often baseless, attacks on Judge Jackson. Sadly, I think the truth about this is less relevant because a principal goal here is about stirring up division and scoring political points. Instead of a conversation about the significance of Judge Jackson becoming the first black woman to sit on our nation's highest court, what it will mean to have a Supreme Court justice who's served as a trial judge for nearly a decade and as a federal public defender and as a private practitioner and as a clerk at all levels, what it will mean for her experiences, her life, her grounding, her faith, her character, to be part of the deliberation of our nation's highest court. Instead, sadly, we are treated to a series of, I think, meritless attacks that were more distraction than substance. So let me close, if I can, with just a few thoughts that I think matter um, as we move towards a vote. Judge Jackson testified she cares deeply about our Constitution and the rights that make us free. The truth of her statements borne out by her own life experiences, by her career in the law, her record on the bench, and her thoughtful and measured responses to all of our questions, even those presented in the most aggressive of styles. Her judicial, her judicial methodology is rooted in her understanding that the role of a judge is a limited one. She is the kind of judge humble enough to know that the Constitution and the laws passed by Congress say what the law is, while judges have a limited role to decide questions based on the law and the facts presented. This nominee, this nominee, 
brings me joy and a sense of pride that as a nation we are moving in the right direction. Based on our constant project of delivering an America that lives up to the aspirational words written by our founders. The Supreme Court decides cases that mean something, that have an impact in the lives of millions of Americans, that teach the world what our system of democracy and the rule of law can actually accomplish. And I think having her as someone who served on the Sentencing Commission, as a trial court and appellate court judge, as a public defender, in that court will continue to improve our nation in ways we don't yet fully know, but where I have confidence that in her bones she knows how important our Constitution and the rule of law are to securing liberty and equality before the law for every American. Mr. Chairman, I mentioned Ruby Bridges in my opening now a week ago. I had the honor of meeting Ruby Bridges when I was on a civil rights pilgrimage with the late Congressman John Lewis. What's always struck me about the painting that Norman Rockwell did of Ruby Bridges was that as a very young girl marching into school, that by an action of the United States Supreme Court was open to her for the first time, there were tomatoes and slurs on the wall behind her. And yet she held her chin high, she was straight, and she marched forward with a sense of confidence, despite just outside the frame of that painting there being a howling, angry mob. So too I found that Judge Katanji Brown Jackson conducted herself in questioning here with her head held high, with a sense of confidence in our Constitution, in our democracy, and in the rule of law. Our role in confirming a justice to the highest court is among our most solemn obligations, and I am honored to vote in support of confirming Judge Jackson to be the next Associate Justice of our Supreme Court. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Senator Coons. Senator Cotton. You know, Democrats in the committee and Judge Jackson herself have repeatedly said that senators should look to her record to see what kind of justice she would be. Although some of our Democratic colleagues now claim that it's engaging in conspiracy theories to dare to ask Judge Jackson about that very record. Her record and her answers are clear. Judge Jackson may be a fine woman, but she has built her career as a far left activist. And that didn't change when she put on a black robe 10 years ago. In fact, Judge Jackson remains more of a defense attorney for criminals from the bench than a judge. Across the board, Judge Jackson's average sentences for criminals are 34% lighter than the national average for criminal cases and 25% lighter than the average on her own old court, the D.C. District Court. And the child pornography cases are just the most sensational examples of her soft on crime attitude. In her hearing, she talked about how deeply disturbing these cases are and how she always gave the criminals a really serious talking to for their possession and distribution of videos of young children being sexually abused. But a serious lecture is not a serious sentence. These aren't just numbers, these are criminals with real victims. And they go on to victimize again because Judge Jackson lets them off early. One of those criminals was Wesley Hawkins, who was a serious child pornography offender that Judge Jackson let off easy. The sentencing guidelines recommended eight to 10 years in prison, eight to 10 years. Judge Jackson gave him just three months. And that's only one sixth of what her own probation office recommended. And a few years later, when Hawkins would still have been in prison if she had followed the guidelines, he did something else that got him six more months in custody, twice the original sentence. When all 11 Republicans on this committee sent a letter asking for details of what happened, Judge Jackson refused to provide any further information. I guess so much for looking at her record. Of course, her leniency isn't limited to these child pornography cases. In 2017, Judge Jackson apologized. She apologized to a fentanyl kingpin with a history of drug trafficking because she couldn't find a way to give him less than the mandatory minimum sentence imposed by Congress. And she felt bad about being so mean to a fentanyl kingpin. A couple years later, though, she found a way to twist the law 
to resentence him below the mandatory minimum sentence by making the First Step Act retroactive, even though, even though Congress had explicitly chosen not to make it retroactive. She also said that there were no victims in the case. Fentanyl trafficking is not a victimless crime, and anyone who doesn't understand that does not belong on the Supreme Court. Judge Jackson also granted compassionate release to a man who brutally murdered a deputy U.S. Marshal by shooting him on the steps of a church at a funeral. He was repeatedly denied parole, and in prison he had racked up infractions for things like threatening prison staff and possessing a dangerous weapon, not exactly a reformed saint. Judge Jackson granted him compassionate release anyway because he had high blood pressure. In 2013, a sex offender had repeatedly raped his 13-year-old niece and was arrested for falsifying sex offender records to avoid telling the government where he was living or that he was working at a daycare despite a restriction on his contact with children. The government asked for him to go to prison for two years. Judge Jackson gave him just one year. During that second year when he should have been in prison, yes, he went on to try to rape again and then bribe the victim with $2,500 to recant her testimony. Judge Jackson habitually sympathizes with criminals over victims. These are just a few of the many cases in Judge Jackson's record that all make one thing clear. If you are a criminal, you would be lucky if your case is assigned to Judge Jackson. If you are the victim of a crime or anyone else seeking justice, you better hope your case got assigned somewhere else. As a trial judge, Judge Jackson could only give the benefit of the doubt to one criminal at a time. As a Supreme Court justice, she would be able to give the benefit to criminals nationwide in all cases. Let's consider her terrorism cases. She has, seems to have a real interest in helping terrorists. Now, it's true that you shouldn't judge a lawyer solely for taking on an unpopular case, and defending criminals doesn't necessarily make someone ineligible to be a judge. But during the Bush administration, representing terrorists was all the rage in liberal legal circles. These were not unpopular cases, but instead, lawyers at liberal law firms and public defender's office fought with each other to be able to work for these terrorists. Judge Jackson represented four terrorists as a public defender, one of whom she continued to represent in private practice. She also argued in favor of terrorists in two other cases in amicus briefs while in private practice. Her backers try to have it both ways. On the one hand, they say this is all just assigned work, but on the other hand, they celebrate her as a hero for volunteering for so-called assigned work. Well, whether it was assigned or volunteered, the fact that Judge Jackson didn't do a very good job. In three of the four cases, her filings were identical, word for word, comma for comma. She alleged identical facts and legal arguments in every one of those cases. The only differences was the swapped out name and case numbers. So let's look at those terrorists. One of her terrorist clients was the, designed the prototype shoe bomb that was used in an unsuccessful attempt to blow up a passenger airplane. Another of her terrorist clients planned and executed a rocket attack on US forces in Afghanistan. And another of her terrorist clients was arrested in a raid on an Al Qaeda explosive training camp. Yet in Every case, she claimed that her clients had nothing to do with terrorism and had never been affiliated with Al-Qaeda or the Taliban, despite having no reason to believe that her alleged facts, copied and pasted from one brief to the next, were true. Judge Jackson also has a habit of refusing to answer simple common sense questions in her hearing and in questions for the record. Famously, when Senator Blackburn asked her what a woman was, she claimed that she had no idea I asked her who has more of a right to be in the United States, new American citizens who follow the rules, waited their turn and came the right way, or illegal aliens whose very first act in the United States was to break our laws and who continue breaking them every day that they remain here illegally. Judge Jackson declined to answer. And when I asked Judge Jackson whether releasing Guantanamo Bay terrorists would make us more safe or less safe, she again pretended to have no clue. And of course, she refused to take an opinion on court packing unlike the justice she would play Stephen Breyer or the sainted Ruth Bader Ginsburg. 
Judge Jackson plays ignorant not because she doesn't know these answers, but because her liberal judicial philosophy is based on denying reality and trying to invent a new reality through the brute force of will as a judge. Judge Jackson's attempts to invent a new reality demonstrate a willingness to skirt the law when it doesn't fit her preferred outcome. Not only did she engage in what the Sixth Circuit called an end run around Congress to make the First Step Act retroactively reduce the sentence of that fentanyl kingpin I mentioned earlier, she also worked hard to strike down a Trump administration policy of removing recently arrived illegal aliens. The law passed by Congress granted DHS, quote, sole and unreviewable, sole and unreviewable discretion on the issue. But Judge Jackson inserted herself to strike down what she called, quote, a terrible proposal by DHS, as if it's the judge's place to decide what is and is not a terrible immigration proposal. The D.C. Circuit Court, no hotbed of conservative activism, reversed her and noted that, quote, there could hardly be a more definitive expression of congressional intent than the clear language of the statute she disregarded because she didn't care. She had an anti-Trump op-ed to write in the form of a judicial opinion as part of her addition for the political left to put her on the Supreme Court one day. Last week, Senator Durbin said that despite Judge Jackson saying explicitly that she doesn't have a judicial philosophy, she does have one, but, quote, you have to take the time to read any or all of her 578 opinions that she has issued. And for once, Senator Durbin and I see things similarly. Judge Jackson has a judicial philosophy, and that philosophy is obvious from her record on the bench. Judge Jackson will coddle criminals and terrorists. She will twist and ignore the law to reach any result that she wants. That is not we need what we need from a Supreme Court justice, and that is why I will vote no on her nomination. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to join in thanking you and the ranking member for conducting these hearings in a really judicious way to adopt my colleague's baseball analogy. We've seen not only wild pitches, but more than a few brushbacks and even some beanballs. And I think you have conducted these hearings in a way that encourages us to look at the truth and look at our role in history. We've seen a lot of meritless demagoguery, concocted outrage, and in fact, even this morning, nothing really new and nothing true in many of the attacks on Judge Jackson. The fact of the matter is that Republicans have repeatedly supported Trump-appointed nominees that had similar sentencing records as Judge Jackson. There are six of them in the record, but they've chosen to raise this hypocritical line of attack on the first black woman to be nominated to the Supreme Court. When these kinds of lies have become so blatant that even the right-wing media echo chamber can't support them with a straight face, it really is saying something. The latest Republican attacks in recent days continue that trend, cherry-picking data and slanting analysis to try to disingenuously smear a distinguished jurist. We all recognize that child sexual abuse material is abhorrent. That's the reason why I have led bipartisan legislation with members of this committee to stop it and hold accountable anyone who would enable it. And we have voted unanimously to bring that legislation to the floor. The American people really are having nothing of these attacks. She has wowed America. Any of us going home over these past weekends have seen a standing ovation for Judge Jackson from the American people. And the reason is that her nomination will be historic. We are, in fact, making history. It is a joyous and exciting moment for all of America. Her nomination will make the Supreme Court look more like America and hopefully think more like America. It is, in effect, a giant leap into the present. Because the present of America 
looks like Judge Jackson and a more diverse judiciary at every level that President Biden has sought to achieve. And we have supported in achieving on this committee. Representation matters. It matters for the legitimacy and credibility of our whole judicial system. Judges are the voice and face of justice in America. Their credibility matters. They have no armies. They have no police forces. They have no power of the purse. The United States Supreme Court depends on its credibility and the trust of the American people that it will think like they do. It is unelected, appointed for life, one of the most undemocratic kinds of institutions you could possibly imagine. And so, as excited and proud I am on this day, I also am sad that we are seeing this partisan divide on this committee and in this Congress on this extraordinarily well-qualified nominee. My colleague, Senator Cornyn, talked about legitimizing consent. Legitimizing consent means that the American people consent and legitimize the Supreme Court. If we treat the Supreme Court like another political branch, it will become one. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and right now we are fulfilling it. The United States Congress, and most especially my Republican colleagues, are fulfilling that prophecy by engaging in a party-line vote against a nominee that is superbly qualified by character and intellect and will make history as the first black woman to be confirmed. Voting along strict party lines means it is more likely that the Supreme Court will vote that way too. Regardless of how the court votes go, the public will perceive the court as more political, more polarized, and less legitimate. The court has many self-inflicted wounds. The failure to adopt a code of ethics is one of them, and I have advocated that code of ethics, and I asked the nominee about it, and she said she would talk to her colleagues. But the partisan combat we're seeing today is a wound that the United States Congress inflicts on the court. Now, this nominee has an emotional intelligence in addition to legal intellect. She is a bridge builder. She aims at consensus. My colleagues question whether she had a judicial philosophy. Well, normally, the way you determine judicial philosophy is to look at decisions and opinions, not asking the judge to describe it. She has ruled for and against the Trump administration, for and against labor and collective bargaining, for and against qualified immunity, for and against class certification, because her methodology is to follow the facts and the law. And as she said in Moberez v. Kerry, where she declined to evaluate the plaintiff's claims because doing so would have required, quote, making and imposing policy judgments of her own about the wisdom and or reasonableness of decisions, end quote, she knows her lane. That's her methodology, to stay within the judicial lane. Finally, as to law enforcement, I found overwhelmingly persuasive her description of what it was like for her to grow up with members of her family involved in law enforcement. Her uncle, who was a chief of police, her brother, 
a cop on patrol, quote, I'd make these, I'd make three observations in response to those critiques, meaning the critique of her law enforcement background, she said. The first is that as someone who has had family members on patrol and in the line of fire, I care deeply about public safety. I know what it's like to have loved ones who go off to protect and to serve and the fear of not knowing whether or not they're going to come home again because of crime in the community. As you said, my brother, my brother patrolled the streets of Baltimore and I had two uncles who were career law enforcement. She is someone who knows what it means to respect and enforce the law. And she has a respect for the law, not just words on the page, as my colleague, Senator Klobuchar said so well. She has respect for the impact of the words of judges in opinions they write and what they speak in their courtroom. The effect and the impact on everyday Americans, just as Justice Breyer has done throughout his career. These abstract legalisms, the abstruse pronouncements from the bench, they affect everyday Americans. She knows it. And that's how she will make the Supreme Court think more like America. We are making history here, not only uh, for ourselves, but for generations to come. Quote, one of the things that having diverse members of the court does is it provides for the opportunity for role models. Since I was nominated to this position, I've received so many notes and letters and photos from little girls around the country who tell me they are so excited for this opportunity and that they have thought about the law in new ways. All of America will think about the law and about the court in new ways. And little girls, women, all Americans will hopefully have more respect and trust for the courts. She is, as she said, standing on the shoulders of others who couldn't be here today. Constance Baker Martley, John Lewis, her parents, and thousands of others who fought and some died for changes in the laws so that we would think about the law in new ways and she would become our first black woman on the United States Supreme Court. I will proudly vote for her. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to thank you for the way you've conducted these hearings. I uh, and also appreciate the hard work on the part of your staff, especially your chief nominations counsel, Phil. Thank you all for the work you've done. Um, as I said last week, I'm not going to be supporting Judge Jackson's nomination. I sat through the majority of the hearings a couple of weeks ago and submitted more than 300 questions for the record. Um, I just have come down to uh, believe that she may do the very thing I'm most concerned with, and that's rule on cases in a way that achieves a preferred policy outcome, not necessarily what the Constitution dictates. The, um, Probably the, the Make the Road case is probably the best example where the plain text of the statute was looked past. A nationwide injunction was imposed only to be struck down by the D.C. Circuit. But the other thing that, I'm, that, that makes me feel like that, that be, it, it may come to pass that she does um, rule outside of the plain text of the Constitution or the law um, is the very the, the number of people who do support her that I take at face value what she said I asked her if she had any connection with the Arabella group or demand justice some of these other Radical liberal activist organizations. She said she didn't but she's on their top pick list everywhere you go whether it's demand justice shortlist for uh, President Biden uh, Sierra Club 
uh, a number of the other organizations within the, the Arabella uh, radical, liberal, activist, group, activist groups seem to think that she would be a good addition to the court. And their activist outcomes couldn't be further from what I want to see uh, with respect to the future of our nation. Uh, but I'm also concerned that Judge Jackson wouldn't take a stand on my question about packing the court. Now, I know some people have said that, uh, that Judge Barrett, now Justice Barrett, uh, did not answer the question directly. It's a very different question now than it was when Judge Barrett was here. Because now we have these same groups, Demand Justice and others, um, they have organizations focused on nuking the filibuster. And on January the 19th, we came really close to doing that. And we all know that if that occurred, it laid the predicate for expanding the Supreme Court. I, for one, it won't be the sole factor, but I, for one, if I have an opportunity to sit on this committee and consider a future Supreme Court justice, it will be a weighted factor in my decision whether it's coming forward from a Democrat judge or a Republican judge with respect to being concerned, considered on the Supreme Court? I think a simple answer, very similar to what uh, Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer done, would have been a great way to, um, to calm my fear about the worst possible thing. We could talk about these hearings being politicizing and divisive, but nothing would be more politicizing, divisive, and destructive to the Supreme Court than to expand it and pack it. So those and other reasons, including some of the responses to my more than 300 uh, questions for the record, I'm not going to be supporting Judge Jackson. I am a realist. I know that she's going to be confirmed. I think we've had a colleague on our side of the aisle also announce support. And I just wish her family um, very well. I got an opportunity uh, during one of the breaks to go up to her parents, and I told them, uh, that they clearly raised her right. I mean, she's the realization of an American dream. And they should be very proud, and the supporters here should be very proud of her. This is not about um, the content of her character. I think I judge that to be very strong. This has to do with future decisions where I believe, and I hope that I'm proven wrong, uh, that Justice Jackson may go in a direction that runs counter to much of what we've talked about today. Um, so, uh, I will not be supporting her nomination, but I do wish her and her family well. And I um, look forward to maybe everyone listening to what they said today and in the future, whether it's a Supreme Court hearing or a Circuit Court hearing, exercise some of those words with respect to our individual behavior and action. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator Tillis. Uh, and now, Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I welcome everyone in the audience here. For right, we're listening to the Senate Judiciary Committee. They're meeting ahead Chairman, of a key vote on Judge Jackson's confirmation to move ahead to the full Senate and eventually potentially be confirmed as the next justice of the Supreme Court. We've heard uh, all of the Republicans so far saying that they will not be voting to move ahead with Judge Jackson's confirmation, offering their reasoning for why. And so far, every Democrat that has spoken has said they will be supporting her nomination and has have explained their reasoning. Uh, let's bring back political reporter now, Brittany Shepard, along with ABC News contributor Shauna Lloyd, a trial attorney and managing partner at the Cochran Firm, former Republican Congresswoman Barbara Comstock, and Democracy for America CEO Yvette Simpson. Uh, Sean, I want to start with you. Chairman Dick Durbin started off the meeting with an indictment of Republicans' conduct in the confirmation hearings uh, and praising Judge Jackson's poise under fire. Let's take a listen to that moment. They repeatedly interrupt and badger Judge Jackson and accuse her of vile things in front of her parents, her husband, and her children. They even suggested that Judge Jackson, a mother to two wonderful daughters, quote, endangers children. Judge Jackson is a better person than me. She stayed calm and collected. She showed dignity, grace, and poise. It is unfortunate that some moments in our hearing came to that. But if there is one positive to take away from these attacks on her, it is that the nation saw the temperament of a good, strong person ready to serve on the highest court of the land. Shauna, what did you make of how she was questioned? Did you think this was different than other recent Supreme Court confirmation hearings? And what did you think of Judge Jackson's performance? 
you know, look at going into this, um, we expected her to have to face, she was going to face tough questioning. They were definitely going to go after her record. We anticipated that. So I don't think it was a surprising. I think some of the nuances and the levels at which they tried to find things um, went a little bit to the ridiculous. But, uh, you know, it is what it is when it comes to these types of hearings in this particular day and age. I thought that she remained poised. I thought that that was the way you have to. Eh? When you're looking at these types of hearings, you know, demeanor is going to go a long way. And when you have anyone that's trying to rattle your cage in that manner, she kept it very professional. She kept it very dignified. And she always took it back to the record and to her stance and her role. She was clear about changing, making those delineations between when she was an attorney versus from when she was a judge and making those demarcations. Because I think that that was important depending on what her role was when she was being questioned. I think she did a very good job of also keeping it to the facts as she knows them to be and staying away from policy questions. Brittany, Senator Whitehouse pointed to so-called dark money groups that influence judicial appointments on both sides. So what role do outside groups play in these confirmation proceedings and why are we hearing so much about that now? Well, Senator Whitehouse has been talking about this dark money groups for a couple of weeks now. He has his script down pat. And there is a significant amount of influence, both monetarily, but also politically, that outside groups have in pushing certain nominees. Leonard Leo, the Federalist Society, you heard Senator Whitehouse say his name. Very impactful group here in Washington, up and down Pennsylvania Avenue, in K Street, on getting conservative names in front of conservative White Houses. And, of course, there are liberal equivalents. Um, and trying to make sure that the folks that people want to exact change on their behalf are in front of the Supreme Court and Senate Judiciary Committee. Of course, the White House maintains that their nominees that they put forward are the most qualified people, the people who are willing to rise above politics, just like Katanji Brown Jackson said last week during her hearing, and we heard a little bit from her Democratic supporters here today in the chamber. But these outside groups have existed as long as these nominees have been public in front of the television. And, and honestly, as far as pocketbooks have been deep in Washington, I think it goes back hundreds of years at this point. Um, but they're very, very effective in getting their nominees at least up to the circuit court. And from there, it's on the White House to push nominees and the president to decide who was going to have his or, well, her, her maybe one day ear. And Senator Lindsey Graham said that uh, President Biden could have gotten more Republican support if he had chosen a more moderate candidate. Let's listen to that. Again, I'm inclined to vote for judges of the other side. Uh, but this choice of Judge Jackson was really embraced by the most radical people in the Democratic movement, to the exclusion of everybody else. After four days of hearing, I, hearings, I now know why the left likes her so much. It became obvious to me why she was their first and apparently only choice. So there are people that President Biden could have picked that would have been in the liberal camp in terms of voting on the Supreme Court, uh, and they could have gotten 60 to 65 votes. The White House didn't go down that road because it feels that they must pick somebody that's more appealing to the hard left. They made that choice, and we'll see how it plays out. Barbara, what's your reaction to that? Do you think President Biden could have gotten more Republican support with a different nominee? Barbara? Barbara, I think you're on mute. <laughs> Barbara, I think you might be on mute. <laughs> All right. It looks like it looks like Barbara is on mute. Uh, Yvette, what do you think? Do you think that um, that a different nominee, one of the other judges on President Biden's shortlist, would have gotten more Republican support? I don't know. I don't know why. I mean, the reality is, and it was said earlier, that this justice, justice uh, soon to be Justice Justice Jack Jackson, is overwhelmingly popular with Democrats and Republicans. Twenty two thirds of Americans uh, really like her. Uh, Eighty eight percent of Americans think she's seriously qualified. She's got pedigree on both sides. She's got um, support from you know the the National Police Association, which is not a left organization. She's shown herself to be pretty balanced. I 
think Lindsey Graham wanted his candidate. And he was upset. Uh, I think he displayed himself dishonorably um, by putting that on uh, Judge Jackson. It's not her responsibility that he didn't get his choice. So I think it was Lindsey Graham saying, if you had picked my person, I would have rallied my people uh, to support them. And because he did not, he's deciding to vote against a very qualified, amazingly popular, both with Republicans and Democratic candidate. And I think that's a misstep for him. All right, and it looks like we have Barbara back now. Barbara, what do you think? Well, I don't think there would have been that many more votes regardless of the nominee, because unfortunately these have become very political events. And outside groups have been involved since the 90s because of that, but on both the left and the right. I actually worked with an outside group for the confirmation of uh, Justice Roberts and Alito. And you had the same kind of attacks on them that you're now seeing you know, from the other side against uh, Judge Jackson. So while it's unfortunate that that um, has been the case for you know, 20, 30 years now, um, this is an historic nomination. She is going to be confirmed. And I think, as, as many have discussed, she'll be a great role model, even though I'm sure I'll disagree with a lot of her opinions. <laughs> Now, Shauna, Senator Ted Cruz used graphs to try to point out discrepancies in Jackson's sentencing record, and he claims that her sentences are, quote, wildly out of the mainstream. Uh, Senator Chris Coons, however, said the American Bar Association did not find that, uh, that she was out of the mainstream in more than 250 reviews. So what do you make of these arguments about her sentencing record? And the big focus, particularly, it sounds like, on, on the Make the Road New York case. You know, when we're looking at these sentencings, obviously statistics can be, you know, altered depending on how many cases you're taking, how, what is, how many of these cases were, uh, you know, cases that she took often and what percentages. When we look at her sentencing record, what the ABA has found is that she is within the mainstream of sentencers. This is a particularly sentencing structure that has had a lot of pushback from judges that are sitting on the trial level. So I think that what we're seeing is, yes, her record, but what we see is a larger issue with the judicial judiciary in these particular sentences. Um, you know, the ABA has definitely stated that she's within that the range and they don't see a discrepancy and they are the bar, the organization, you know, over lawyers and judges and they do these types of re reviews consistently to find out where judges are. When it comes to these particular types of cases, we find that they are extremely polarizing because they do involve minors and typically they're extremely graphic and horrific in nature. So what we know is that this is going to be an issue that is going to swing very far and wide in opinion. But her record is consistent with most mainstream judges. All right. And Senator Hawley is now about to speak. Let's listen back into those proceedings. Based on the answers that I heard from her then and in response to my other colleagues, I can say definitively that I like her. I think she's a good person, but I cannot support her. And I want to say a word or two as to why. We heard from her. She told me this actually when we sat down together in our meeting, and she said it again under oath that she has no particular judicial philosophy. She's said in response to questions that she has no view on whether or not people have natural rights, curious. She told Senator Blackburn she can't define what a woman is, but the one thing that she seemed to be very comfortable saying quite definitively is that she thinks the U.S. federal sentencing guidelines for criminals are too harsh. She said it repeatedly here under oath. We've talked about it at length. Her record reflects it. And I just want to say that I agree with my Democrat colleagues on this point, at least. When it comes to a judicial philosophy, it probably is true that the best way to ascertain a nominee's judicial philosophy is to look at their record. And for days, that is exactly what we have done. I sat with the nominee and went through 55 pages of transcripts in her cases. We talked about multiple cases, other Senators questioned her on this score as well. And when you look at her record in depth, her consistent policy position is that the federal sentencing guidelines are outdated, they are outmoded, they are too harsh, and that criminals in general are oversentenced. And I just have to say, I couldn't disagree with her more. You know, she's very clear in her cases, and I commend the transcripts of her cases to everyone who is interested. If you read the transcripts of her cases, when she sentences criminals, and particularly in the child pornography cases that we've discussed so much, she routinely says that she has significant policy disagreements with the federal sentencing guidelines. She's very open about this. I mean, she, this isn't a secret. She's very open about it. 
And again, it's very clear in the child pornography cases in particular. This is why in 100% of those cases where she had discretion, 100% of the time, she sentenced below the federal sentencing guidelines, below the prosecutor's recommendations, and we now know frequently below what the probation office confidentially recommended. In the Hawkins case, in the Sears case, in the Kane case, in the Hilly case, we now know she recommended below or sentenced below what even the probation office recommended in their confidential reports to her. And she did it based on policy. And for me, this is very key. This is a very thoughtful person. Judge Jackson is not someone who's just wandered in here. She's very accomplished. She's very thoughtful. She was on the bench for 10 years, has been on the bench for 10 years, served on the Sentencing Commission before that. She's given these issues a great deal of thought. And I think that her views on these issues as it relates to sentencing and criminal justice are very well considered. I just disagree with them very fundamentally. Here's the policy that she discussed with us and that she has repeatedly discussed in her cases. She says that she disagrees on principle. When it comes to these child pornography cases, the criminal should be getting a higher sentence based on the number of images they possess. That's what the guidelines say. You should get a higher sentence based on the number of images. She repeatedly says, for the record in these cases, and she said it here to this committee, to me, to Senator Graham, to Senator Cruz, and others, that she thinks that that is wrong as a matter of policy. I think that that is fundamentally mistaken. The more images there are, the worse the crime is. The number of children being sexually exploited and images made of child sexual exploitation isn't decreasing, it's exploding. In 2019, the New York Times reported after an investigative survey that there were 45 million images of children being sexually exploited on the internet. Last year, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children said that number was up to 85 million. 45 to 85 in the space of just two or three years. I just disagree with Judge Jackson when she says that we shouldn't be sentencing criminals based on the number of images they possess. I think in this age, in this set of circumstances, she's fundamentally wrong and the guidelines are right. She says that she disagrees on principle with the enhancement for using the computer, using the internet. She made that very clear. She says it in the cases over and over. Fair enough, but I think she's wrong. In an age when child exploitation is driven by these images that are exploited, are, are distributed through the internet, through computers, to set aside computer use as a reason to give a higher sentence, to ignore the guidelines on this, I think is a mistake. I think it is a very fundamental mistake. She said that she doesn't give enhancements based on the sadistic nature of the images. She said that over and over in the cases we looked at. In the Hawkins case, she says it. In the Cooper case, she says it. I also think that that is fundamentally mistaken as a matter of substantive policy. I do think that if you have a criminal defendant who possesses images that are sadistic in nature, where children, babies, are being sadistically sexually abused, that person ought to spend more time in jail. I do think that is worse than a criminal of, an, of another variety, of another type. And I'm not the only one. Prosecutors including a prosecutor who testified to us two weeks ago, who are experts in human trafficking, have made the same point. This, this prosecutor who was before us here on the committee, she spent 18 years prosecuting these crimes. Her testimony was an offense that involves a computer is worse than an offense that involves the mail. An offense that involves more images is worse than an offense that involves fewer. An offense that involves young children is worse than an offense involving older children. Judge Jackson's view, is that we should treat everyone more leniently because more and more people are committing worse and worse child sex offenses. I'd say exactly the opposite is what we should be doing. If more people are committing worse child sex offenses, if there are more images, if the images are more graphic and exploitative in nature, then more people ought to be spending more time behind bars. And here again, I would submit to you that her judicial philosophy on this point is why she is consistently sentenced below not just the guidelines, not just the prosecutors, but as we have seen, the national average in these cases, and even below her colleagues in the D.C. Circuit. And by the way, Judge Jackson's aware of this. If you look at the transcripts of her cases, Judge Jackson, to her credit, by the way, she's very thorough, Judge Jackson frequently will ask the U.S. Sentencing Commission for data on what the averages are for this kind of a crime in other courts and in her court. In the Cooper case, for instance, Judge Jackson, this is another one of the child porn cases, Judge Jackson 
look to statistics about the average sentence given to similarly situated defendants. She asked the Sentencing Commission to calculate this. Her own statistics, or the, really the Sentencing Commission statistics, revealed that she sentenced Cooper, in this case the defendant, to 41 months below the national average. I know that because she knows it. She cites it. It's in the transcript. Here's my point. Judge Jackson, as a matter of policy, sentences below the national averages, below her colleagues. And by the way, the prosecutors know it. Read the transcripts. The prosecutors come into court, and when they appear before her, they say, Judge, we know that you have policy disagreements with the guidelines. We know that you think they over-sentence. We know you think they're too harsh. They know it. They argue with her based on it. Some cases pleading with her, you know, at least give the defendants. In the Hawkins case, this is the 18-year-old who had thousands of images, all those videos of, of young children. They plead with her, at least give him two years. That was below the guidelines. At least give him two years. She gave him three months. I think this is why, this core judicial philosophy is why we see her doing things like apologizing to some of these offenders, just like she apologized to Wesley Hawkins. She said she was sorry for him. Now listen, I just have to say, I'm not sorry for him. I'm not sorry for these offenders. I am not sorry for the offenses they have committed and where they have gotten themselves to. They should go to jail. They should go to prison. And my fundamental disagreement with Judge Jackson is not based on her character or her integrity or her accomplishments. I think those things are beyond question. It's based on her policy and her philosophy. And I think on these core issues, she is just dead wrong. Now let me just say this. Finally, in conclusion, we've heard in Judge Jackson's defense, and I don't know it's really much of a defense. I know she didn't say these things, but in her defense by the White House and members of this committee, we've been told things like the child pornography is actually all a conspiracy. It's not real. It's just a conspiracy. It's made up. Let me just say for the record, sex crimes against children are not fiction. They are not a conspiracy. There are 85 million images of children being exploited available on the internet. I'm a former prosecutor. These are real crimes. I'm a father of three young children. These are real children. And these aren't victimless crimes. Just because they're images doesn't mean real kids aren't involved. As again, as we heard testimony from prosecutors and experts just two weeks ago, child pornography creates a cycle of trafficking, of exploitation, of abuse. It is the children here who are the victims, not the criminals. On that core point, I disagree fundamentally with Judge Jackson. I wish her well, but I cannot support her nomination. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Booker. Mr. Chairman, uh, I want to thank you and the ranking member uh, for doing everything you could to, to have a, a good hearing. And I really mean that, uh, Mr. Chairman. You have been, to me, one of the great mentors of mine in the Senate, but watching you here is the best of, uh, best of Durban, your, your best hits, I think, in trying to do this. And I will say to the guy you're smiling at right now, I don't know if I help you or hurt you when I make say such nice things about you, sir, but you are a gentleman. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time in Iowa, uh, and you, are, uh, you exemplify Iowa nice, and uh, I, do, I, I appreciate the way you've done it. Uh, this has been an interesting experience. Uh, I've... I've I often think maybe we should be holding this hearing during December because, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if you know about the vaunted holiday of Festivus, um, uh, which is the holiday for the rest of us during the holidays. And one of the aspects of Festivus is the airing of grievances. And I think that we've had probably the best Festivus celebration here uh, in this hearing over the last week or so because there's been a lot of airing of grievances. Now, I'm one of these people that thinks uh, that there's no false equivalency here, that, that the grievances that I've seen since I've been here from uh, the ridiculousness of Merrick Garland and, and when he was nominated, not even having a hearing, not even meeting with him, or even some of the language. I recently looked at the quote, one of the quotes from one of the people on this committee on the Republican side who talked about if Hillary Clinton won, we should just leave any Supreme Court vacancies if the Republicans can control the court. But I'm also self-interrogate enough to know that... Um, I shouldn't just sit here and air my grievances and listen to their grievances. And that's why I'm really appreciative of uh, Ben Sass, uh, Senator Sass, and uh, I think the Oxford English Dic Dictionary is now a new word for next year, jackassery. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tom Tillis. I, I don't, again, agree with his uh, equivalencies on everything, but I see an earnest person trying 
uh, to figure out how we can make sense of this place and return more to patriotism, less towards partisanship. And I've listened to every time he spoke, he's made appeals to those higher angels, and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, I really do worry about where we are spiraling towards. Uh, I worry about hearings like this, where the majority of people on both sides, I think, were well within the zone, but I heard things that were just ridiculous and, and painful and hurtful, uh, and I, I do worry, and I hope that maybe when the cameras are off and some of us can get together and talk about how do we repair and how do we heal. I have not resigned myself to the inevitability of this is where the United States Senate is going. And the collateral damage to this, and it's not all, all us, I think the Supreme Court has done enough damage to itself with its lax uh, ethics rules, but the legitimacy of the court has sunk pretty dramatically over the, uh, uh, over the last years. And I think a lot of it is because of the spectacle that we've seen uh, here and now, and, and that really, really concerns me. Look, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, I don't think I know, it was President Lincoln who said, the world will little note uh, nor long remember what we say here, and I know that's for my words as well. Uh, this is a frustrating experience uh, to see this happen, but I wanna make a couple points and then shift to my final point. I think we do real damage to our own agendas here as elected leaders when we so vilify each other that we create these caricatures. I made the mistake in one Supreme Court hearing, and it was not intentional, but even when it came out of my mouth, in talking about a Supreme Court justice, I used the word evil. I did not intend to do it, and if context, I think, might save me, but how horrible it is to describe another human being with terms like I've heard here, uh, uh, evil. I remember my governor, who was Republican, my friend, uh, was running for president, and the, the, the right had so vilified Obama, had so dehumanized him, that when my governor and Obama hug after, hugged after a natural disaster, it was used in campaign commercials against my, my, my governor, and he dropped over 10 points because he did the sin of somebody that we had so vilified, so demonized, that human interaction, that a hug is such a violation of our tribe that it actually hurt them. I, I sometimes see some of my friends that might run for president on the other side. I think I might foil their campaigns by going around hugging them. Because that's where we've gotten in America right now. We've so vilified each other. And that's why I just want to address the absurdity of, of the vilification of, of Judge uh, uh, Katanji Brown Jackson. <laughs> Even the rhetoric I've heard used here, I kept writing things down. Judge Jackson is not an extremist. She is not out of the judicial norm. I, I, I've heard language, I won't read through all the attacks on her that I've heard in this hearing today, not to mention the previous days. I, I, I'm sorry, who, who does the American public want to believe? A bunch of elected senators or the independent folks are out there. To say she's a, a, an extremist on crime belies the fact that she has law enforcement group after law enforcement group supporting her. So if you want to say that she is an extremistly soft on crime, then you're saying that about the FOP. You're saying that about the IACP. Go through all the organizations. If I hear another person trying to wrap themselves in the obvious that all 22 of us find abhorrent sexual crimes and somehow want to glorify themselves to being, hey, I'm a prosecutor. I pro well, both people on both sides. I got, I got my back full of prosecutors over here. And I see noble people that did, did the Lord's work of prosecuting these crimes as well. But here's the absurdity to say that somehow she is not strong against these cases again. These are just lies. I, again, a, a, a senator just said, I believe the guidelines are right. Well, Obviously, Republican-appointed judges don't agree with him because the norm in many states is 70 to 80 percent of judges going before the guideline. And if that statement is correct, then why didn't you vote against every one of those Republican judges that was not following the guidelines, as most don't? You could try to create a straw man here, but it does not hold. And, and it's just frustrating to me to listen to people trying to create a caricature of a human being whose family is law enforcement, who is a parent, 
and who is well within the norm on these cases. And again, I'm an elected official just like my colleagues on the other side, so don't believe me. Believe all the victims' rights advocates that have written in on this issue. There are organizations that represent hundreds and hundreds of organizations on victims of sexual assault, women and children. Just, I don't need to read the horrific stuff that they deal with every single day, but God bless America. The National Children's Alliance, a national organization that works on behalf of children who have been sexually abused. They have a 924 member organizations. All would con con concur with the Republican, or excuse me, a conservative magazine that called what, what Senator, my colleague, and Senator Hawley is saying that these, these things that he's saying are meritless on the verge of, of demagoguery. And, and so I could go through all the things that balance the world out here because you come in here and the way we talk about each other, the way we talk about a justice is so disrespectful. I, I, I respect the criticisms. I voted against Amy Coney Barrett. I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but the way we talk about each other, the rhetoric that is so disrespectful, so much of a caricature, so far out of the lines, of what independent groups and law enforcements and victim advocacies that support this candidate would say. Which brings me to the final point I wanna make. I, I am hearing from people, not just black women, but particularly black women, who have been relating to me their stories about having to come into a room where you're more qualified than the people who are sitting in judgment of you and having to endure the absurdities of disrespect that we saw Judge Jackson Endure. The stories I'm hearing are replete from folks in all kind of jobs and all kind of experiences in their lives who are so qualified, so worthy, and what they've had to endure. And that's what struck a chord this week. I, I don't think, again, we are going to have our political substantive dis disagreements, but it was the treatment in some of these questions that, that triggered a hurt in so many people I know and have encountered, how could they create these caricatures? How could they, they, they create these exaggerations? How could they disrespect a person like her who has done everything right in her life and in her journey? How? How qualified do you have to be, double Harvard? How qualified do you have to be clerking at all levels of, of, of the federal judiciary? How qualified do you have to be three times confirmed by the Senate in a bipartisan manner. And so, Senate, I have to say, today is the birthday of a great poet named Maya Angelou. And so I'm just going to end with those words. Why does this poem strike a chord with so many Americans? Because they feel it to their bones. And so this is in honor of Maya Angelou and the next Supreme Court Justice of the United States of America. Happy birthday, Maya, Dr. Angelou. You may try to write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me down in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I rise. Rise, Sister Jackson, rise, Judge Jackson all the way to the highest court in the land. And when we have that final vote, I will rejoice, ancestors will rejoice, and we will say, Lord, this is a day that you have made. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Booker. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we all appreciate having had the nominee's time and her willingness to meet with us and the, I think we all enjoyed meeting her family. And indeed, she has a very impressive resume. She has worked hard to build that. But our concerns and our disagreements do lie with how she has addressed child pornography, how she has addressed her sentencing practices, her release policies, her work with terrorists, her work with uh, agencies, overreach that is there, and indeed her immigration policies. And I want to uh, talk a little bit about one of the exchanges that I had with her. I did ask her 
about the United States versus Virginia uh, case. That was the Supreme Court's landmark women's rights case, and it did strike down VMI's male-only admission policy. Now, I'm not an attorney, but I understand from so many attorneys that this is a case that anyone, first-year law school, would be familiar with. They would know this case, but Judge Jackson claimed not to be familiar with the case, so I asked her whether she agreed with Justice Ginsburg in that case that there are physical differences between men and women that are enduring, and she refused to answer. So then I asked her a very simple question. I asked her to define the word woman. Wasn't a trick question. It's something that everybody learned in grade school science class. But Judge Jackson refused to answer. The fact that she couldn't or wouldn't answer that question speaks volumes. It tells me that Judge Jackson is beholden to the radical left that is teaching our children that they can choose their own sex. It tells me that she is more committed to woke progressive ideology than she is to common sense and the rule of law. And it tells me that she will not be able to decide with impartiality the cases that are sure to come before her as a Supreme Court justice. How, for example, will Judge Jackson be able to resolve sex discrimination claims if she can't decide whether the parties before her are women? How can she decide Title IX cases if she doesn't even agree with Justice Ginsburg that there are enduring physical differences between men and women? We recently saw a Ninth Circuit judge issue a written opinion stating that, and I'm quoting, people of all genders can become pregnant, end quote. And disputes over biological males competing in women's sports are working their way through the federal courts. How can a Judge Jackson decide any of these issues as a Supreme Court justice if she is too afraid of the radical left to give this committee a definition of the word woman? Judge Jackson's refusal to answer my question underscores the dangers of the kind of progressive ideology that she endorses. In the time since Judge Jackson sat before this committee, Disney has eliminated saying boys and girls. The State Department announced you can select X as a gender on your passport. The TSA will implement gender-neutral security screenings. The left has slowly but surely stripped words of their meaning in an attempt to eliminate dissent. And the latest victim of this campaign is the word woman. Americans from across the political spectrum want a Supreme Court justice who isn't divorced from reality, who has common sense, and who will protect their children and their right to rear their children as they see fit. Parents live in fear of the progressive ideology that is being pushed in some of our schools. I hear from them regularly. But Judge Jackson's answer to my question made perfectly clear to me and to everyone watching that she will be a certain vote for government overreach in private family decisions. She has written, and I'm quoting her, these are her words, that every judge has personal hidden agendas, end quote. That influences the cases they decide. While that may not be true for all judges, it is of concern at many cases, and it is of concern that this is her view, this hearing, the judge's record have made it clear that she will interpret the Constitution through the lens of progressive ideology. Her refusal to define a simple word, woman, is only one example of many. Another is her desire to make excuses for some of society's worst offenders. 
She has suggested that we are too tough on child predators, and as a judge, she has ensured that these offenders receive some of the lightest sentences possible. She serves on the board of a K-12 school that teaches kindergartners that they can choose their own sex and teaches them about so-called white privilege. And she has praised the now discredited 1619 Project and has stated that judges should consider critical race theory in sentencing criminal defendants. This hearing has revealed the extent of her personal hidden agenda, which explains why she is the favorite pick of some of the radical left dark money groups. But the role of a Supreme Court justice is to interpret the law, not to take up arms in a culture war. She promised the committee that she would decide cases from a neutral posture and that she would rule consistent with her judicial oath. While she may be sincere in that pledge, I still have concerns that her ideology may influence her jurisprudence. As I told her, her primary commitment must be to the Constitution, not progressivism. For those reasons, I am certainly going to vote no for Judge Jackson. Before I close, Mr. Chairman, I did want to address a point of process. You have repeatedly dressed down my Republican colleagues and me for asking Judge Jackson tough questions. You did it throughout the hearings, you did it at last week's markup, and you've done it repeatedly in the media, including before we even had a chance to ask a question. You called our questions vile, baseless, and imputed dishonorable motives to us. My colleagues and I express legitimate concern that Judge Jackson sentence child pornography offenders to less prison time than the national average. Judge Jackson and my Democrat colleagues claimed that the probation reports justified her decision, so we asked to see them. It was a reasonable request, but you responded by insinuating that we wanted to hurt children, and you specifically questioned why I, as a mother, would take that position. That was a surprising comment. We want to make one thing clear. Questions are not attacks. Confirming a Supreme Court justice is one of our most important duties as United States senators. This is a lifetime appointment, and it would be a dereliction of duty to our constituents not to ask tough questions. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Since you raised a question about me personally, I'm going to respond personally. And uh, I would just tell you that I have said repeatedly and will repeat at this moment, the majority of questions coming from the Republican side of the aisle were fair, respectful, and asked tough questions because that's what we're here for, to ask tough questions about somebody aspiring to a lifetime appointment to the highest court in the land. I took exception to several of my Republican friends I never named a name, so if anyone took it personally, that's their decision. Uh, if, if the shoe fits, I think they went too far. And I think some of the things they said about this judge don't reflect the reality of who she is and what she has accomplished in her life. Uh, and I, I think it was my responsibility to try to keep us on the straight path of judging her in a fair manner. The point about pre-sentencing reports, I will repeat so there's no question. This Judiciary Committee has never requested pre-sentencing reports. And I was not going to be party to that effort that some of them suggested in writing to me. I then spoke to several Republican senators, and we talked about the details, and they said, oh, I didn't realize that's what we were asking for. You're right. We shouldn't get those reports. Why? Those reports are created by courts to sentence an individual. They are confidential in nature. They interrogate not only the defendant, but they interrogate a lot of innocent third parties, even children who are survivors. They come up with information which is seen only by a judge, as it should be. And they have to realize that what they say about the defendant or about the defendant's family or their relationship with them, and some of it can be very personal and very specific, is ne never expected to leave the courthouse and find its way into this committee. I'm just not going to be party to that, Senator. I'm sorry. I, I said it clearly. I'll repeat it again. I'm not going to have it weigh on my conscience that a mother of a child who's been exploited lives in fear that that pre-sentencing report, which she thought was confidential, is not. 
too much to ask. We've got plenty of information to go on around here. And uh, I don't think we should ever consider that. I will vote against it consistently, whoever's in the chair, Democrat or Republican. Senator Rossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Grassley. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for convening and leading and at times moderating these proceedings. Uh, it has been a real honor on behalf of my constituents in Georgia to participate in this process. Uh, and there are few nominations as significant or as deserving of seriousness of purpose, due diligence, and hard work on our part as senators than a lifetime appointment to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, I have approached these proceedings acutely conscious of the gravity of our obligation to do our constitutional duty, as my constituents in Georgia expect. And I entered this process with an open mind. Uh, I met at length with the nominee in private. My staff and I reviewed her record and writings and qualifications in detail. Uh, I had the opportunity to ask questions of Judge Jackson for uh, nearly an hour in the several days of public proceedings uh, that we held here in the committee. And, you know, as a, as a new member of the committee, Mr. Chairman, I'll confess that some of the back and forth uh, about process and precedence dating back decades uh, was new for me. And it's clear that there are some hurt feelings, uh, some, some grudges that, that members of the committee may be nursing. And I understand that. Um, but we're tasked with something extraordinarily important here. Uh, and at its best, these proceedings uh, should be a pinnacle for the Senate, a moment when we come together in public and we grapple with some of the basic principles of constitutional law. Uh, we subject uh, a nominee for the highest court in the land to tough but fair questioning about their qualifications, their approach to the law. And so again, I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for consistently working to elevate these proceedings to their highest purpose. Um, while she was testifying before the committee, I asked Judge Jackson about her approach uh, to freedoms of speech, of assembly, to uh, her understanding of the historical roots and significance of the First Amendment protection of the free exercise of religion, engage with Judge Jackson uh, to understand her approach to the Fourth Amendment, protections against unreasonable searches and seizures, uh, and how she would approach such cases as new technologies present the court with new facts and circumstances. Uh, I engage with the nominee about the Sixth Amendment right to counsel, uh, the Gideon v. Wainwright decision, and her experience as a federal defender. Uh, we discussed the separation of powers, um, her uh, understanding of the constitutional history and her approach to questions of the constraint of governmental and executive power. Throughout this process, I have been deeply impressed by Judge Jackson's professionalism, by her depth of knowledge, um, by her deep understanding of relevant case law, and by the seriousness, seriousness with which she approaches her duties as a judge. Her record uh, is one where she's ruled for labor and she's ruled for management. She's ruled for the Trump administration. She's ruled against the Trump administration. She's ruled for business. She's ruled for environmentalists. Uh, she's ruled in ways that would make liberal members of Congress happy and rules that would make conservative members of Congress happy. Without regard for her personal preferences, she has uh, applied the law and she walked us through the methodology um, by which she ensures that she arrives at neutral, fair, and impartial decisions. Uh, she conducted herself with great poise and strength and grace uh, while under heavy questioning and at times attacks that, in my view, were cruel and unfair. 
Uh, and we had the opportunity, thanks to you, uh, Mr. Chairman, to question independent nonpartisan investigators from the American Bar Association uh, who testified under oath that in the course of interviewing her colleagues from the bench and the bar, folks she had worked with throughout her life, undertaking a systematic review of her writings and decisional history, that they found no derogatory information whatsoever that raised concerns about her integrity, her impartiality, her credibility, and in fact, that she has a sterling reputation with colleagues, whether they were arguing against her, whether she ruled for them or against her, throughout a, a legal career um, where she has built impeccable qualifications. She's worked as a federal defender. She'll bring that unique perspective to the Supreme Court. She's worked in private practice as a litigator. She's uh, served as a federal judge at the district and appellate levels. And throughout her career, um, she has not just favorably impressed, but uh, demonstrated superb and exceptional professionalism and capabilities. And that came through uh, in the work that the ABA investigators did in reviewing her record. Mr. Chairman, Judge Jackson is poised now to make American history and to demonstrate to our fellow Americans and to the world what this country stands for at its very best. She has earned the respect of the nation through her exemplary conduct throughout this process. She will be a superb addition to the US Supreme Court and I look forward to enthusiastically voting to move her to the floor today and supporting her on the floor. And I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for the privilege of being a part of these proceedings. Thank you, Senator Ossoff. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, men are free. The author of this quotation today would probably say people are free. And human life begins on the far side of despair. That, of course, is a famous quotation from a preeminent 20th century French philosopher. That philosopher went on to say in another way, to be is to act. In other words, all we are, from at least one perspective, is the sum of our actions. Put yet another way, what you do is what you believe. And everything else is just cottage cheese. I found uh, Judge Jackson to be smart, well-versed in the law, and uh, how can I put this, extraordinarily deft and artful in her uh, ability to speak at length without saying anything of substance on critical questions especially the, uh, the limits of judicial power and the importance of judicial restraint. That is not a, 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 a characteristic solely of Judge Jackson's testimony. It seems that many of our nominees, not just for the United States Supreme Court, have, uh, have adopted that approach for some time under other administrations. I regret that. For that reason, I spent uh, a lot of time reading Judge Jackson's opinions. Uh, she hasn't written a lot of law review articles. That's not a criticism. She just hasn't. And I did take a look at the piece she wrote when uh, she was much younger. But given the length of time, I put more emphasis on reading her opinions. And my conclusion is, um, and I think the best evidence of that, if you, if you take a look at, had to look, read one opinion by the judge, I would encourage you to read Make the Road New York 
case, which was uh, her case on immigration. Um, well written, but I think her true feelings about the limits of judicial power are expressed in that opinion. She was reversed by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. I don't agree with the judge uh, on where, she, how, based on her opinion, she draws the limits of judicial power, and I don't think she places as great an importance as I do on judicial restraint in a Madisonian system of checks and balances and separation of powers, and for that reason, I will be voting no. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Um, let me say a few words about where we stand in the committee. I, no one, I don't think there's anyone else who's not been recognized. Um, at this point, every senator in attendance has had the opportunity to speak. We have a problem, and it could have happened to any one of us. One of our colleagues, Senator Padilla, got on the overnight special out of Los Angeles last night, took off, and a medical emergency on the airplane forced them back to Los Angeles. And so there he was, uh, stranded and unable to return until this morning. Uh, it's my understanding that he's going to be on a flight that will return this afternoon. And so he will, will have a chance to assemble uh, with his presence. This really calls on all of us and uh, in terms of the Senate and its traditions. There was a time when pairing for a vote was common, where someone with two senators with opposite positions on a vote would agree that neither one of them was going to vote so that the outcome would not be affected. Those days are rare. There's been one exception, and I point to Senator Coons of Delaware, who made an accommodation to the late Senator Johnny Isaacson in that circumstance. And we still remember it, Chris. It was a magnanimous gesture on your part. But we're in a little different position because this is not a run-of-the-mill ordinary vote. This is an important one that everyone here has thought through very seriously uh, and we should take very seriously. So it is my intention to recess subject to the call of the chair. I believe that Senator Padilla will be back at, in time this afternoon for us to consider uh, this nomination and a record vote and the six other nominees who are pending before the committee. Uh, I will keep you posted through your staff as to the progress that he's making in his return. Uh, he, he thought he'd done everything right. He put his whole family on the plane last night, and they all were brought back to Los Angeles. I know it, it, it troubles him, it pains him not to be here. So that is the circumstance. And if nothing further comes Mr. before the committee. Mr. Chairman. Senator Lee. I just want to respond very, very briefly to a, a conversation we had about the pre-sentence reports a moment ago. I want to be very clear. Not one of us has suggested that any PSR should be released to the public. What we have said is that um, she made them relevant. She uh, opened the door to them by saying that you know it was necessary to understand uh, how sh she imposed sentences in those in those cases. That it, uh, that it would be apparent if we could see everything, including the pre-sentence report. So she opened the door to that, making them relevant. Not one of us has suggested that those ought to be publicly disclosed. I, having handled those um, at previous stages of my career, I know they are sensitive. I also know that we, as a committee, have handled documents that are sensitive before. We could review them uh, in a skiff, uh, treat them as classified, just as we have uh, on countless occasions, treated other sensitive documents that way. Uh, to the extent they're um, uh, uh, that the circumstances require it. We could even redact out victim names uh, and uh, uh, replace them with uh, John Doe 1, 2, and 3, or Jane Doe 1, 2, and 3 references. There's no reason why we couldn't review those. And, and it's, it, in any event, it's not, um, it, it's not fair. It's not a correct characterization to suggest that the decision is whether to make them public or leave them private. We're not arguing for that. We never have. Senator, I'm, uh, that issue has been debated, and I'm glad to give you your point of view to express. But I just want to tell you, not on my watch. Not on my watch. Some mother protecting that child is not going to understand redaction and the oath to keep things secret in the United States Senate. 
I'm sorry. I'm not going to be the first senator to open up that door. I think too much of the process and the promise of confidentiality to do it, nor do I think it's necessary to judge this judicial nominee. So if there's nothing further, I'd ask that the committee stand in recess subject to the call of the chair. continuing uh, to watch the Senate Judiciary Committee there uh, just ahead of its key vote on Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's nomination to the U.S. Supreme Court. She is expected to be confirmed with at least one Republican vote, by the way. Re Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine just announced last week that she would vote to confirm Judge Jackson. Joining me now, Democratic strategist Sochi Hinojosa, also ABC News' Brittany Shepard, former Trump administration official Sarah Isker, the Honorable Judge Yvette McGee-Brown, and civil rights attorney Shauna Lloyd. Okay, a lot to unpack here as we've been uh, following the committee uh, meeting. Uh, ladies, let's uh, start with you, Brittany. Um, Senator Grassley, actually, we've actually seen a number uh, of no votes uh, so far today uh, from the members. Uh, no surprise, we're expecting Republicans to vote no. So we are more than likely looking at a split vote in the committee. So what happens next? Right, exactly, Kira. What a morning it's been. Chuck Grassley was the only maybe we thought going into today, and with his no, it's 11-11 when Senator Padilla makes his way from LAX, presumably, to DCA. Um, we heard Chair Dick Durbin say that they are in recess until Senator Padilla is able to get to the Capitol, be able to sit in the chamber and issue his yes vote to garner that tie. Well, what happens after there's a tie? Then Senator Chuck Schumer in the greater chamber is going to have to force the vote out of the Senate Judiciary Committee. That could happen probably tomorrow, probably not later today. There's some time constraints because the committee also has other business, a couple of other, I believe it's six or seven other um, justices that they'd like to move forward to other courts. I mean, all eyes, especially if you're the White House or in Democrats, are outside of the chamber on putting pressure on other Rep Republicans. You just said Susan Collins is the sole yes vote across the aisle. Biden and his staff are crossing their fingers, hoping they'll get at least um, Senators Murkowski and Mitt Romney on their side as well. Okay, Judge Brown, uh, it was a pretty contentious day. Uh, not surprised, although we still expect Judge Jackson to be confirmed as she would be the first justice in history with a background as a public defender. Let's just talk again about how important that is. It was raised numerous times today. You know, it, it's... It will be so wonderful to have somebody who has actual criminal defense experience sitting on the high court. We've all seen over the years all of the number of people who have had um, been declared innocent after spending decades in prison. And I think it's important that when you're looking at criminal justice cases, that you have someone who understands what it's like to not have the resources to adequately present your defense. And so she will be the first justice since third Good Marshall, who has actually had criminal defense experience, it will add, I think, a richness of analysis to all of the cases when they're talking about whether it's the Miranda issue or Fourth Amendment, particularly as we move into a more technology-based era, how do we apply the Fourth Amendment to individual rights? And Shauna, if confirmed, Jackson would be the first black woman on the Supreme Court. We have talked about this. We've talked about the historical significance of this day. But we can't, uh, there, there, of course we should keep talking about it. <laughs> there isn't enough time uh, to keep talking about this. Let's just emphasize again how this process has gone so far. I mean, she has received a tremendous amount of support. Um, it really has gone smoothly, if you think about past confirmation uh, hearings. Um, so not only is it historical, but it, it also has gone very smoothly thus far. 
Absolutely. I agree with you compared to, you know, what people may have thought. This has gone very smoothly. I think that when we look at this particular nominee, you know, outside of these hearings, she is very much seen as someone who is um, a little bit more middle of the road. She is, she is, you know, sided with law enforcement and against law enforcement. She is sided and is lauded by individuals on both sides of, you know, political parties and different stances. So I think when we look at this particular candidate, we see one that is well received across different areas and different spheres, which I think is really important. To have that unique, diverse voice on this Supreme Court would be a huge advantageous thing for all of us. Because when we're looking at these cases and deciding such important, you know, cases about things that affect all of our rights, we want a diverse group of people that can bring different perspectives and different ideas to making those decisions. Brittany, if, if you don't mind just backing up for a minute as we were just listening to uh, just the kind of the breaking news of Senator Padilla and the fact that the senator will be delayed, which is why we went into a break uh, and things have kind of come to a halt. What does that delay mean for today's vote? Just give us some background on, on how this is going to go now. We weren't expecting this. <laughs> Not at all, but it's never it's never an easy day in, in Washington for things to go uh, on time, especially uh, with Biden as president. He's not known for keeping a, a tight schedule. Yeah, it looks like we're getting in some reporting. This Hunter Padilla's flight from LAX, which was delayed last night, might not get in, in even until 4 p.m. today, which means he might not even get up to the chamber until 5. There are some interesting congressional um, kind of arcane rules that uh, the members of the committee can draw that says that they cannot have new business two hours after the full Senate convenes, um, which basically means in layman's terms at 3 p.m. They usually only have two more hours. That brings you up right till 5. I think it makes some difficulties for what happens if there is a tie and looks like we have all the data to think that there would be, especially when Padilla is there, 11-11. Republicans know 11 Democrats resounding yes. Uh, it means that Senator Schumer won't be able to force the vote out of committee until tomorrow. So that's looking that means uh, anyone who thought we'd have a short day of business tomorrow, uh, <laughs> they better get their coffee and start brewing it now. It could be another four, five, six hour day because there is other business and Congress has to do its job to do everything else. Um, so I think that's the big takeaway that the timeline is being pushed back maybe a day or two, but it still means that Katanji Brown Jackson is going to be able to be brought up in front of the full Senate by the end of this week before the two week Easter recess. That vote will probably come on Friday if no other major uh, curveballs come our way. All right. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. We we usually have a curveball or two when it comes to something like this. That is for sure. We've already uh, seen the curveball thus far. Um, Judge, let me ask you about this because it came up again. Um, some of the GOP senators said that they were not swayed uh, by Jackson's assertion um, that she doesn't have a judicial philosophy uh, per se, but instead a methodology that ensures that she rules impartially. Um, a number of senators hammered on on, on this today. How, how important is that? And, and, and what's your feeling on a philosophy versus a methodology? I, I think she's absolutely right when she says she has a methodology, and that's what we should expect from any jurist. I have hated these labels of originalist, textualist, you know, that we should interpret the Constitution um, as a document that's fixed in time when it was written or a document that's living and breathing. The reality is, and I say this often to law students, that the wonderful thing about our Constitution, quite honestly, is its simplicity in terms of being able to be applied over the centuries. And when you start talking about originalists, it really, to me, is kind of a misnomer because what the framers had in mind when they wrote the, uh, the Constitution, Black people weren't citizens, women had no rights. It just seems to me that it's a red herring. What you want is a methodology. You look at the Constitution. What do the words say? What was the meaning that the framers put behind those words, and then you apply the meaning of the words to the facts and the laws that we have today. I don't like trying to trip people up into whether they're originalists or textualists. I think having a methodology in terms of how you approach a case, how you look at the law that governs, how you look at the facts and apply the law to the facts is what all of us would expect of our judges and justices.
And Judge, as you watched the hearings, whether it was the, the, the first round of hearings or, or these round of hearings, um, she she definitely, especially when she, she was speaking and she was being questioned, Judge Jackson kept coming back to the law, the law, the law. This is mm -hmm. how the law is interpreted. This is how I used the law in this case. Because there were a number of senators really trying to go after her and, and try to label her with a philosophy, specifically when it came down to the sentencing uh, in these child porn cases, right? But I thought mm -hmm. she did a really good job at just remaining calm and once again bringing it back to the law. And by the way, a law that she put back on members of, of Congress as well um, uh, when it came to how how judges actually make their decisions. That's absolutely right. And she made the point that they just kind of jumped over. If Congress isn't happy, if the senators aren't happy with how some of these cases are dealt with, they have the power to change the law. And just like when Republican uh, nominated jurists are sitting there, they also will say, I can't give you an answer on something that might appear in front of me. She was very consistent about how she applies the law and how she approaches the law. And they wanted to take one sliver of of cases and say, well, why did you do this? Or why didn't you impose the maximum sentence? The sentencing statutes are the province of Congress and they could change them at any time. And I think you heard the chairman of the committee say that they have not addressed some of these issues because they've become very difficult and people don't wanna go on record with them. But it seems to me that she struck the appropriate balance of listening to the victim, listening to the pre-sentence investigation report, reviewing the facts and what the defendant's prior record was. That's what you want a jurist to do. And and so, um, Brittany, let's let's talk about Judge Jackson when confirmed. I guess we're supposed to technically say, uh, um, you know, if indeed she is confirmed, but I think we know where this is going. Um, looking forward, what are some of the first cases that she could face? Well, Kira, you know, she will be coming off right at the end of the term that's in August and will have the Supreme Court will have just um, offered some kind of comment on a, a stalwart abortion case known as a Mississippi, Mississippi versus Mississippi case uh, around here. She will uh, likely be hearing interesting cases about affirmative action, especially in the Ivy League. You heard during her hearing about a week and a half ago that she told Senator Ted Cruz made some news that she would recuse herself from that case if it is brought up in front of her. Um, very controversial when it comes to who is getting affirmative action and not. She's also likely to hear cases about um, transgender athletes. That's why these Republicans um, during their questioning of her have been very, very critical to have have her define what is a man, what is a woman, and she's rightly recused herself to say, well, those kind of issues might be coming up ahead of me in the court. That will obviously be very, very controversial. Republicans trying to make it a political mark ahead of this really hot midterms year. This issue has been sparking up in classrooms everywhere, in school jurisdictions everywhere, and it'll likely be uh, hotly watched. All right, Judge Brown, why don't you bring it all together here for us. You know the nominee uh, personally. You know others that know her well. How do you think she's feeling today? This is probably a lot easier, right, sitting back and watching versus having to be in the hot seat, right, and think of every single word that she's saying on national television. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I think that um, she probably is a bit more relaxed than she was during the initial hearing, but I don't know that she's taking anything for granted because we all know it's not done until it's done. And so I suspect she's sitting and watching and uh, a bit nervous um, and anxious about the vote uh, being completed, um, but hopeful. That's how I would I'd imagine she is, hopeful. All right, ladies, thank you so much. Appreciate you, uh, Judge and Shauna and Brittany. Uh, always good to have you around for our, our powerful discussions, especially when it comes up to lifting uh, women and women in firsts. All right, well, coming up, a night out uh, turns uh, pretty chaotic. Six people are killed, 12 others injured, and now there's a search on for multiple shooters. We'll have more straight ahead.
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. And you've probably been watching the Senate Judiciary Committee meeting along with us ahead of its key vote on Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson's nomination to the Supreme Court. Glad you're joining us, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips, and I'm glad you're streaming with us here on ABC News Live. As you know, the judge is expected to be confirmed with at least one Republican vote. Republican Senator Susan Collins of Maine announced last week that she would vote to confirm Jackson. She was impressed with her. She met with her uh, and will go forward with a yes. Joining me now, Democratic strategist. Sochi Hinojosa, also former Trump administration official Sarah Isker, for more uh, perspective on what we're going to about to see the, the, for the remaining of the day. Sarah, Senator uh, Lindsey Graham, uh, always making a little noise uh, today. He said that if Republicans were in charge of the committee and control of the Senate, that there wouldn't have even been a hearing for Judge Jackson. So uh, let's expand on that a little bit. What do you think he meant by that? Well, clearly a reference to what happened when President Obama nominated Merrick Garland, a D.C. Circuit judge as well, uh, to take the place after Justice Scalia's passing. Of course, Republicans famously did not give a hearing to Senator Garland, saying that they needed to wait until the next election, at which point President Trump won, and President Trump then nominated uh, now Justice Gorsuch to that seat. Lindsey Graham said that if a similar thing happened with a Republican in the White House, he wouldn't hold hearings on that nominee either. Of course, then Justice Ginsburg passed in October, September uh, of 2020, and they did hold hearings and, in fact, confirmed uh, now Justice Barrett to that seat. So for uh, Lindsey Graham to say that they wouldn't hold a hearing if Republicans controlled the Senate right now, I think he's absolutely telling the truth. Um, of course, the history of that has caused a lot of controversy, both for Republicans and Democrats, but also has really dragged the Supreme Court into a partisan fight. Sochi, you want to weigh in? Absolutely. I think the fact that you have Republicans talking about tactical issues versus issues about her record are pretty interesting right now, just because given the fact that they don't have anything to say on her record, they understand that she's extremely qualified. They understand that she will be confirmed. She will be confirmed late this week in a bipartisan vote, which I'm sure Republicans aren't loving, they don't really have anything else to argue. She gave 20 hours of testimony last week, answered thorough, thoroughly about her record, about um, how she would be a Supreme Court justice. She carried herself with grace when she was pressured by Republicans throughout two days. 
And I think Republicans are now grasping at straws. They don't know what to do. They understand that she will be the next Supreme Court justice. They understand that she will make history. They understand that the vast majority of Americans stand behind her. And so they're coming up with um, political shenanigans in order to distract from what is ahead. <laughs> Are we surprised that we are seeing political shenanigans? And by the way, that's the technical term, political shenanigans. Um, Sarah, not surprisingly, uh, Republicans again uh, focused on Judge Jackson's sentencing of child porn offenders and her defense of Guantanamo Bay detainees in the confirmation hearings. Uh, let's talk again about her record there from your perspective that raised concerns um, because I was just trying to look back to see what it was that was said earlier today and, and it did go back to some of our ABC reporting so I might want to just throw this in and it was highlighted by one of the senators um, today that ABC uh, did put together uh, its own research and we talked about this last week um, during the previous administration which would have been the Trump administration that you were a part of and how it handled uh, dozens of cases uh, similar uh, to the way these cases were carried out uh, with regard to, to child porn and the guideline sentences in cases of defendants who were charged of viewing, possessing, transporting, and distributing child pornography. So again, it came up uh, from the GOP perspective that the judge ruled softly. But as ABC pointed out in its own reporting, and once again it was brought up today, that there, oh, we actually have the SOT, so there you go. Let's go ahead and listen to it, Sarah. Thanks for rolling with me, and let's talk about it. Of the 100 offenders she sentenced, there have been just five cases for possession of child pornography, and in every case, she sent the offender to jail. As my colleague from Minnesota ably and thoroughly reviewed, um, she's in the mainstream of judges sentencing in these cases. I'll just add two more pieces of evidence to this ongoing debate, if I might. In ABC News review of federal judges appointed and confirmed during the previous administration, found a dozen had handed down similar below guideline sentences in cases of defendants who were charged with viewing, possessing, transporting, or distributing child pornography. All right, so Sarah, why is this an ongoing debate still? Well, I think it's an interesting conversation. Now, just to back up to something you said, I worked at the Department of Justice as an attorney during the Trump administration, but when we're talking about sentences, the prosecutors make recommendations to judges. Uh, the judges in question are not part of the Trump administration. I think the distinction they're making is judges that were appointed by Donald Trump to circuit judge positions who had previously been district judges with similar sentencing uh, track records to Judge Jackson. And uh, it's absolutely true. It's a conversation that I think is worth having a larger one, not about this confirmation, unfortunately, about what we as a society think should happen with these sentencing guidelines. Because right now, across the board, for the most part, judges nominated by both political parties are sentencing under the guidelines. Prosecutors are asking for more time, often within the guidelines, but on the lower side, uh, judges are, in fact, sentencing below those for the child pornography cases. As others have pointed out, including Andrew McCarthy at National Review, there's a good reason for that. You know, back when the sentencing guidelines were initially created, um, child pornography and being able to get child pornography was much harder. You had to put in a lot more effort versus now where you're online and an image might take you 30 seconds to download off the Internet. While that contributes to supply and demand issues with child pornography, it's not the same as creating those images as being the one abusing those children yourself. So again, I think this is an interesting conversation that I wish we could have outside of this confirmation hearing about whether we need to change the guidelines or whether, in fact, judges should be taking more seriously these child pornography convictions and what the sentences should be. But this confirmation hearing, unfortunately, of course, has become just a partisan bickering match about that question instead of what could actually be an important conversation? You know, that that's a very good point. And we <laughs> have delved, obviously, into that conversation uh, about these sentencing guidelines. Are they archaic? Why are they stalled within Congress? Why aren't charges or changes uh, being made? So it is, even though you're absolutely right, Sarah, it did come up you know, in the confirmation hearings, but let's take it outside of the confirmation hearings. And so, gee, it definitely is a conversation we have to continue to have uh, because Judge Jackson did make it very clear a number of times 
that again she was following the law she was following the sentencing guidelines that she was that she was working under and that as a mother uh, it, it bothered her to hear the details of these chi child porn cases that they were egregious crimes and that she did what she needed to do uh, under the law so but with that said to Sarah's point uh, do you think this conversation will continue Sochi and do you think because it did come up it continues to come up and this conversation keeps happening this debate keeps happening that it is possible we could see moving forward a change in these sentencing guidelines well, I think both you and Sarah bring up a very good point about this, about what is the crux of this actual argument. And I do think that, unfortunately, the crux of the argument is um, just about political theater at the moment. And I, you know, I won't hold my breath that this will actually change. You're right that Judge, Jack, J Judge Jackson said that these laws were outdated and that they needed to get fixed. You also heard that um, Senator Durbin talked a little bit about, you know, the fact that and other senators have talked a little bit about how there isn't necessarily, hasn't been the will to kind of tackle some of these things. But I think you're right. If Congress wanted to do something about it, they could do something about it immediately. Um, and they've had the op they could do that. And if, if they want to change, they want a different system, then Congress must act. And so I think that it'll be incumbent on the senators of this committee to remind themselves about the discussion that they have had um, and not just use the Supreme Court as um, an, an avenue to do that, but really have a tough conversation and talk about the sentencing guidelines to figure out whether we do need to change them. Because I think that based on this conversation, their beef isn't with Senator Jackson, or I'm uh, um, sorry, with Judge Jackson. The beef, their beef is with actual, you know, Congress who hasn't done anything. And so these are real questions that Congress needs to ask themselves, and they're the ones that can make these changes. Sarah and Sochi, appreciate you, ladies. Thank you so much. Coming up, six people killed, 12 others injured. The search for multiple shooters is on. We'll take you to Sacramento next.